Okay, guys, we are live. Uh, so for those listening at home, welcome to the Dungeon Musings YouTube channel. My name is Kevin Madison, and I will be your friendly... Actually, I won't be your friendly Dungeon Master this evening. I will be your friendly... I guess your friendly Role Master uh, this evening. Because tonight, we are kicking off a, uh, a month of uh, playing Iron Crown Enterprises Classic Role Master uh, Second Edition, or Role Master Classic RPG. We'll be playing this uh, campaign over the course of the um, month for October 2021. Uh, and we, let's see here, um, we'll be playing this on Wednesdays and Fridays. For those of you who are joining us live, I apologize for the late start to the session. We wanted to go through a little bit of the fundamentals for Rollmaster, uh, and uh, that ran a little later than I, we had anticipated, but we are live now. So, guys, let's start off first with um, a quick introduction of who you are, who you're playing. And I don't I think anyone's got any experience with Rollmaster apart from the couple times we, uh, one time I played with John and that's it. So we won't go through that. Why don't you tell us um, who you are and who you're playing. So first up is Jeffrey. Hey everybody, I'm Jeff and I'm playing uh, Jawar. He is a warrior monk of the, sorry, what's the name of it? The Shigrin? Um, Ch Changramai. Changramai. And uh, he's sort of at the phase in his training where now he is sort of a hired out mercenary. Nice. Uh, next up is John. Hey everyone, I am John and I'm playing Z uh, Zart Ordok, uh, otherwise known as Nightwolf. Um, he is a mystic, which is a user of essence and mentalism magic, and he is a descendant, a uh, half scion of the immortal elves. Mm hmm. Nice. A pretty notorious immortal elf father as well, too, but we'll get into that over the course of the game. And last but certainly not least is our resident armorsmith, Dave. Hey, everybody. Uh, hope you're having a great night. Uh, Dave, I am playing Sir Kira Vinci, and... Uh, I'm not going to say I think I got that right because that's the same as in my last name, so I'm going to go with that. And, uh, <laughs> I, honestly, I didn't even think about that. I've yeah. been saying Venture the whole time, but yeah, Venture would make sense. Yeah, because my last name is Forche. Is I, in fact, the funny story, won't tell it, but I had a gym teacher once whose last name was Mr. Pelche, and we had a thing going on about he got my name wrong somehow after lecturing the class on how to say his. So, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Sir Kira Venche, Mr. Pelche, David Forche, all the same. <laughs> and yeah, she is a uh, a knight, a warrior, and a bit of a crusader, we'll call it. Nice. So, um, the I guess for those listening at home who may not be familiar with Rollmaster, uh, Rollmaster is a contemporary of um, Advanced Dungeons and Dragons. It's a game that came out in the 80s. And uh, the game largely uh, came out in response to Advanced Dungeons and Dragons as well, too. Um, as we go through this, we're going to be explaining rules and things like that as we go. But one of the ways to understand Rollmaster is that, uh, for one, it first came out as a trio of kind of, of uh, books that um, supplemented the existing Advanced Dungeons and Dragons rules, things you could bolt on to it. Uh, it was said to have been something you could use with any um you know fantasy system but it just so happened that it had conversion rules that <laughs> kind of ran directly from uh, advanced dungeons and dragons uh the three books that uh, or the things that came out were um character and campaign law uh this is the uh most recent uh, release of, of the rollmaster classic which is a creation of the second edition of it but uh character law spell law and then Arms Law, which they also called Arms Law and Claw Law at uh, certain points. Uh, Rollmaster in the second edition kind of codified into a, uh, a, a, a role-playing game that would make use of all those things. It, it sort of was that with uh, first edition as well too. Second edition is the edition that I'm most familiar with. And second edition uh, as well saw a lot of um, uh, people involved with uh, the expansions that came by way of companions. Uh, second edition had seven different companions that came out adding in new classes and new spells and new options and whatnot. And a lot of the um, uh, names that uh, are kind of, uh, not a lot, but I mean, a few of the names that uh, dominate the current uh, gaming environment all date back from this time, including Monty Cook. Uh, Monty Cook uh, was an editor and a uh, freelancer for Iron Crown 
enterprises and uh, wrote a lot of uh, content for this edition of Rollmaster. There are later editions of Rollmaster, and there's another one that's in creation right now, and they're games that have been based on Rollmaster. Uh, Against the Dark Master is one, Merp and Middle Earth Roleplaying is another one, but it's uh, it, it really has a different uh, feel to it. Uh, than the contemporary games. And again, it's because the game was sort of made as a response to how people were playing and how they were enjoying uh, AD&D at the time. At the time of recording too, I will say, uh, there, so I guess first off, there's also a setting that became kind of the default setting for second edition Rollmaster. Uh, that is the Shadow World setting. Um, one of the books that came out for that is the Jamin Land of Twilight. I got my camera backwards, obviously, so that's it. But um, Shadow World is uh, a setting that was created to, for at first, very much like the uh, the known world in D and D, to try and justify a cohesive world from the existing modules that were out. Um, but then it also sort of grew into its own thing and and kept being supported over time by the guy who created it, someone who was uh, one of the members of the original Rollmaster design team and also behind Space Master and Middle Earth role playing and stuff. I got a guy named Terry K. Amthor. Uh, and the reason, uh, I mean, Terry's uh, Amthor's setting of, of uh, Shadow World and Jamin in particular uh, is really the, um, like his, uh, one of his most significant contributions to, uh, to Rollmaster and to gaming as well too. And unfortunately, uh, it, today his uh, family announced that he had passed away. Uh, so it, um, uh, it just happened to time up with uh, when we were going to be kicking off this month. So, we're going to be dedicating this month's worth of gaming to his legacy and his memory. And uh, I, for myself, uh, played a shit ton of Rollmaster when I was a kid. And the Jamin Land of Twilight source book that he wrote uh, also holds a, a very, very special place in, in my heart for one of my favorite source books from the time. And that's where actually our campaign is set. Like in the course of uh, the month that I spent uh, prepping this game, I had planned on running this in this setting as well, too. So, um, for this setting, for this session, we'll be uh, dedicating the this to the memory of uh, Terry Anthor and the things that he contributed to the not only Rollmaster but to the you know gaming uh, in general. So, our setting, guys. Um, I don't, I don't want to spend too too much time doing like background, so I want to kind of jump right in. Each of the characters has uh, received a background thing for the pre-gen they're playing, as well as a uh, primer for the setting. Uh, you can find the primer posted to the Dungeon Musings Discord if you're interested in reading about it as well, too. But the... Let me show you this, guys. I didn't get a chance to finish the map, unfortunately, but I got fairly close. So this, at the very least, will give you an idea of where our setting is takes place. Now, generally, um, this whole map here is a tiny... Where did I... Okay, here we... Oh, no, that's not going to work. This is looking familiar, Kev. I think I've seen this a few times on Instagram. <laughs> yes. So it's not finished. There are forests uh, all through here as well, too. To give you a sense of scale here, guys, uh, <laughs> this distance between these two shores here is about 10 miles. Uh, so I guess I got to adjust that to make it work quite easily. But our campaign, or at least this uh, month's adventures, will take place largely around the Duchy of Cloven Bay, which covers basically from Cald uh, down through uh, Cloven Bay and Myrna Dune down to uh, Ryden Glen. Uh, this is the region covered by Clo the Duchy. Oh, and uh, Tower Cove as well. Um, You'll see that there is some backstory about Oakford and the kingdom of Oakford in your, uh, particularly for you, Sir Kiera, your father is the master of Myrna Doom. Uh, Myrna Doom is the uh, holding that you can see in the illustration here. Myrna Doom is, uh, just to give uh, some context here, Myrna Doom is... Uh, located roughly a day's travel into the Old Home Mountains, east of Cloven Bay, and is said to have been constructed by the Loari, elves known as the Builders, before the founding of Ulashak, late in the Second Age of Ayr, meaning that these ruins are between eight and 10,000 years old. Um, it consists of a tower and a keep complex and a separate watchtower, both of which perch on the cliffs overlooking Leer, uh, Leary Wiss, which is uh, elvish for Cold Lake, or Loari at least for Cold Lake. 
Um, they are separated by a river that spills into the lake below from a larger lake uh, that's a little further back. Myrna Doom was effectively abandoned by the time the, uh, the grant to Lord uh, Ventier, I'll say it your way, Dave, with uh, the only inhabitants being a small covenant of the Sisters of Aisa, who pray to the Keeper of Souls, uh, the goddess of death, rebirth, and winter. Uh, and they maintained uh, deeper in the Old Home Mountains a shrine called Winter Watch. Uh, the, in the years since receiving the grant, uh, Lord Ventier, and I'll show you, Dave, this is in your handout material as well, too, but I've also got some handy handouts here. Yeah, I'm following along in, in my handout right oh, now. Oh, right, nice. <laughs> yeah. This is Lord Ventier. This is Sir Kiera's father. He's uh, a bit of a stuffy old guy, but he's kind of nice. Uh, he's got a lot of, of, you know, uh, a lot of things on his shoulders. In the years since receiving his grant, Lord Ventier rebuilt much of the elven structure with the help of a local uh, Nomari. It's, it's the Nomari is the dwarvish word for themselves. A Nomari clan, and the Nomari clan came from a dwarvish settlement in Kinderal, right over here. So they assisted in rebuilding it. Uh, in addition, with the support of Duke Rinovar, who is the Lord of uh, the Duchy, uh, Lord Ventier has uh, apparently built an impressive library at uh, Myrna Doom, which is made up of an eclectic selection of rare books, scrolls, and folios that he makes available to any who wish to study there, asking only that visiting scholars leave more knowledge behind when they depart. Uh, this project has been apparently supported by graduates of the Griffin College, which is an ancient Rakhani university, and it's said to be guests... Um, of the, uh, and it's said by guests of the Obelisk, the most popular uh, tavern in uh, Cloven Bay, that is even sponsored by a lore master. The, um, let's see here. I'm going to go to your handout here because I'm reading from, uh, uh, what do you call it, from the other. Um, let's see. Da -da 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 -da. Uh, your father... Uh, is a skilled warrior and leader, having served Duke Renovar loyally in his wars with Sirkakar raiders from the north. Those are Viking-ish kind of raiders that come from the north. Um, uh, against Placidari dark elf pirates, there's an island to the far south on the continent of Jaden that has dark elf immortal pirates uh, and that uh, ply all the waters around the coasts of Jamin the continent on which you guys are adventuring, and a protracted war with the neighboring king, uh, kingdom of Oakford and its perfidious ruler, King Olin Trove. However, you knew nothing of his time before he became master of Myrna Doom. Uh, you know that he descends from the line of the Talathi, a line of men who founded most uh, all, a line of uh, humans, I should say, uh, who founded most of uh, all the great kingdoms of Jamin. But when pressed, he simply responds, uh, not all the past is worth knowing. That, of course, is a curious statement coming from a man who apparently has dedicated much of his life to, uh, to preserving knowledge of the past. You only have faint memories of your mother as she died when you were still an infant. You do not know the specifics of her death, as your father will not discuss it, but your brother, uh, Halen Ven Ventier, which I think I've got in here too, there's Halen. Halen Ventier is your older brother, and what he told you is that she was killed by an elven spirit that haunts Myrna Doom. Though, of course, he may have just said that to scare you. Uh, your older brother, by three years, Halen Ventier is the uh, heir to uh, the house of Venti, and as a child, he teased you that the only thing that you had to offer the family was a good alliance by marriage. While he did his best, to, uh, while uh, he did his best to follow in his father's martial footsteps, it quickly became apparent to all that you were the true heir to his martial legacy, excelling in swordsmanship, horseback riding, and tactics. Halen's not the only other child raised at Myrna Doom. As your father opened his home to a variety of others uh, who were either orphaned or otherwise unwanted by their parents. These included the Harazi Kaya, which Andrew's going to be playing, the Sirkakar girl Yirsa, which uh, Arlen will be playing, and the twin half elf brothers, Zarta Crick and Zartor Dak. Zarta Crick played by George, and Zartor Dak played by John. 
I refuse to believe we were unwanted. We were fostered here. <laughs> uh, though, of course, you know uh, Zartacrick and Zartordak by their Jamari uh, translation of their names, White Wolf and Night Wolf. Uh, you also learned later that the twin brothers shared a father with Vartalon, who's the old half-elf owner of the obelisk, and a strange half-elf wood wizard who lives in the forest around Myrna Doom named Nemrais. Uh, that one is going to be played by Will. Eight years ago, your brother left to study at the Magical College in the flying city of Eidolon, uh, a powerful and ancient metropolis located on the southern coast, I'm uh, sorry, northern coast of Emer, a uh, land, uh, a continent south of Jamin and across the Malurian Straits, along with the twin, uh, the half elf twins that you grew up with. In his absence, you have become one of the most fearsome warriors in the Duke's service. You can fight effortlessly in full plate armor, maneuver your charger across a battlefield with ease, and few swordsmen in the region can match your skill at arms, to the point that you become a feared opponent in local tournaments. Uh, you also have become a skilled sailor, having spent half your life among the wharfs of uh, Cloven Bay, and you first bloodied your blade driving off a band of Sirkakar warriors who were uh, bold enough or desperate enough to attack Cloven Bay two winters back. Your house trainer, Vinit, who is in a handout as well. Believes that this is the reason that you were granted knighthood by the Duke uh, at such a young age. Although your father continues to deny you a squire, uh, stating that children should not learn from children. You found an eager fellow student of arms in Irsa, Arlen's character, uh, who herself excels in martial training, and you benefited from the same lessons that her tu the, that your tutor, uh, Vinit, offered you. Um, the years of training and attending at tournaments together have made you two close, and some would say best friends. Uh, she fought at your side when you drove off those Sirkakar raiders who had gone a Viking. Uh, our story opens with the planned return of your brother and the twins from their studies at Eidolon, with the expectation that your brother will take up his position as the heir apparent, your fate at this point is uncertain. Now, the one thing you wanna take a look at, uh, Dave, is the secrets that you hold. These are things that uh, on the things each of your characters has secrets that only your character knows. You can feel free to reveal these or bring them out or whatever else at your leisure. So, where our uh, scene will open is, I think, in the in the halls of Myrna Doom. So, Sir Kiera, you are fully kitted out in. Well, I guess let me ask you this: Do you think that um, when you have a, an appearance uh, before your father? That you, um, that you always wear your full armor, or, or do you wear like uh, the way that like a knight appearing before his his lord to get missions or, or like tasks or quests or whatever might do, or uh, do you think that um, you would be appearing in in more casual clothes, more befitting of a of a noble lady as you are? Um. So I think Sir Kira, she. While she loves wearing her full plate armor, uh, or like being wearing her armor, um, unless it's a situation that is going to require her to go off to fight, she's probably wearing like the leather jerkin and uh, you know like a nice cape sure. and whatnot. But she's not going to show up at court in a dress unless she's. You could have been to. sparring earlier uh, this morning. You know, early morning sparring session with Vinet, uh, perhaps. So you make your way in uh, to, you're making your way through the, the halls and you make your way into your father's study. Uh, you know he's gonna be in there because um, it may not surprise you to learn a guy who uh, spent most of his life rebuilding a collection of uh, books and tomes and scrolls and such. Uh, he is um, has a study that is very full of many of his um, books and his own scholarly work. So you approach the door and do you think that the relationship you have with your dad is such that you knock on it or that you just enter in or what? I would always knock. Okay. You knock and you can hear from within your father's voice. Come. She pushes the door open. Father. Steps in, closes it. Kira, please 
Come, come in. Uh, he does not rise. He's sitting at the one of the long tables that he has. It's full of books and scrolls and stuff. He seems to be working on something. And um, as is uh, sort of a reminder of his advancing age, he does have a little, you know, uh, eyeglasses that are sort of set on his, uh, the uh, crown of his, um, uh, or the um, uh, crown or whatever, the bridge of his nose. He looks up. Ah, Kira, good. The, uh, and he looks kind of like up and down. Did you come just from sparring? And she walks over to the table and she looks at the food that's probably gotten, the bread's gone stale and the cheese has gotten warm and she pours herself, hopefully watered wine. No, just water, of course. Okay. And she goes and sits over with her father. Yes, of course. I, every day, father, you know. Well, or have you been here so long that you've forgotten the time? No. Uh, of any day, uh, my daughter, today will not be a day that I will forget the time. Because today, your brother returns home. Word has yes. come uh, from Cloven Bay that uh, his ship should be arriving this evening. Yes, yeah, so it'll be good to see him again. It will be good to see him again as well, too. And... We have not discussed things, and Kara, I am, of course, proud of what you have become. Uh, a knight in our Lord's service is no small achievement, and hardly something that I would not, uh, could not have foreseen. Your mother, your mother would truly be proud. But there are more important tasks that will lie before you that will make what has come thus far seem trivial. Father, have you been reading those old tomes again? You sound like you're speaking in circles and riddles. No circles and riddles, uh, my child, just simply that there is when your brother returns I know that you have quarreled with each other at times but he is heir and he will become in time Lord of Myrna Doom and there is a great destiny before him but it is something which will require your assistance. Lords are nothing without their... without those who would counsel and defend them. Yeah, somebody's got to defend him. He can't hold a sword without cutting his hand. That uh, truly uh, was a task or a gift that... Uh, that came to you, my daughter. <laughs> well, it certainly didn't go to him. The what um, I what I would ask is that you ride to uh, Cloven Bay uh, today, and you meet up with your brother. The boys will be back as well too. The elves, twins. Twins shall be returning as well. I hear that both. If I had placed money on it, I would have thought that uh, Nightwolf would not have returned to the den, but I hear both shall be returning as well. Ah, uh, Father, you know they love you. They'll come back every time. Well, well not every time. In any event, I, I would ask that you ride and please... However you may feel about him, make him welcome. Make him know that uh, he, will, he will have your support in the tasks and the challenges that he will face, because he will face many of them. I will. I will. Good. He's my brother. I would ask as well, too, 
I hear sure. that um, our Lord, uh, if you are passing through Cloven Bay, I uh, would ask that you meet in with uh, the Duke as well. Uh, Duke uh, Aldous is, I believe he has uh, something to discuss with you. And uh, is he, it not not his son, is it? So you've heard then. Yes, I've heard rumors about what is supposed to be probably a secret, but were you going to talk to me about this first, or is this... I... I do not know what um, all this... And he kind of correct, catches himself. Uh, the Duke has uh, in mind, but I believe he has long... He has long planned to have you and Dumas wed. Mm. He means it as a way of uniting our houses, and it is a great honor that he shows to House Ventier. We serve at Myrna Doom at his pleasure. And your brother will be inheriting this estate at his pleasure as well. Well, maybe... Maybe Helen can marry him. <laughs> that would still solidify the alliance. And... You see, there's a, a kind of crack that goes up in his thing, the, the, picturing the response of his son to that, and kind of... I trust that you have been trained with better diplomacy skills and will prove to be more diplomatic. Yes, well, I uh, since I'll be traveling on horseback, I probably won't have room for a bright flowery dress so I'll probably have to meet the Duke in full armor if that's you know appropriate for a knight I would expect nothing less uh, my lady I'm sorry Sir Kiara yes thank you father then if you could uh, if uh, the uh, so and you knew you would know that like it's it's uh, on horseback it's going to be about um, it'll take about two thirds of your day to get there mm. Um, see to your horse. Uh, we will have um, see to the stables. Uh, they will ready anything you need. And of course, um, we have, and he kind of gestures down his little coin purse. That's going to give you some traveling money. Good. Looks a little light there, Dad. <laughs> I think you will uh, suffice on with what you have. Uh, oh, and. <laughs> Uh, if you could uh, speak to Lillian as well, too. I believe she has something for you to bring. Lillian is the uh, librarian, the woman who organizes all the, the Saxon collections at, uh, at Myrna Doom. Is there anybody else you want me to take with me on this journey? If you can find them. Uh, that bard has been talking about visiting again, too. Uh, that one who came up, the one who seems to not... to keep talking, Bodan... And any you seek. So if um, what we're gonna, any characters that you know, like if we what spills over to Wednesday and whatnot, too, we'll insert them in. Arlen's character, Yersa, is here right now. Um, Bodan is here right now. Steve's character uh, and um, Nim Rice, uh, Will's character, uh, is kind of lurking around here too. But it'll be fine for you to ride by yourself. Okay. What you can tell to uh, Sir Kira is that the the ride between um, uh, Myrna Doom and uh, let me bring over to the map again and Cloven Bay, uh, it, it's not an unsafe thing. Uh, like it's it's wild. Uh, so like you want to avoid bears, you want to avoid wolves and things like that that are in the wolf in the in the um, uh, region. But it's not unsafe. Like there's not dangerous things like garks or the grauki or bandits or whatnot that sort of lurk in those hills. It's just not that, um, you know, uh, what your character would know is that this, the kingdoms you guys are living in, in, in terms of the, the timing, our adventure takes place in the 6,050th year of the Third Age of Ire. The region where you are was 
completely razed and annihilated by armies of demons and undeath and the Iron Wind at the end of the Second Age of Ire in a series of hundreds of years of war called the Dominion Wars. The kingdoms that you have sprung up here, these are the successors of the successors of the successors that have sprung up in this region. So in that time, all of this has been had a chance to rebuild, for the forest to come back, for the mountains to recover from the titanic shifts that happened as gods and demons and sorcerers clashed. But that's long, long, long in the past. Well, and Sir Kira's not too worried. Like, a bear jumped out or something like that, she'd be fine. Just, she's wondering if, you know, if there was reason to bring anybody else along. Sure. So with that, if there's anything else you wish to do, um, you can uh, take your leave of your father. Freshen up and uh, she says Fare, farewell and she'll get ready. Freshen up and grab some like real food and maybe a glass of mulled wine or something. Okay. So you're uh, chugging some things down. Uh, you need to meet with uh, Lillian as well, too. All right. Uh, so what Lillian, uh, we don't need to uh, role play through that, but what Lillian is asking you to do is to deliver some tomes. There is a uh, visitor. This is something that's quite rare. You've never seen this happen before, um, or at least not in your lifetime, but she's lending books out and she's asked you to retrieve books. There's someone who's apparently staying at the, at the obelisk uh, whose name is, he's a gnome and his name is Nigelius Hearthcut Cole. Lending books out. Okay. Yeah, very unusual. You're not sure you've ever uh, seen Lillian be so cavalier with books. There's a reason that everyone, you know, spends the time trucking up here. Myrna Doom also is, uh, it's sort of a, a, a odd mix of visiting scholars, loggers, hunters, and um, folks who kind of just want to make their life, you know, on the, on the outskirts. So... In the midst of all that stuff, you collect your goods, uh, collect your horse. What is your horse's name, Sir Kerry, and what does it look like? Oh, yeah. Um, what do you think? I think it's, um, you know, while her brother picked a horse that was like almost grayish silver and, you know, had this really beautiful mane, she picked this like patchwork looking mount that you know while still big and sturdy and well trained didn't have that kind of glamour that her yeah, brother yeah. would have liked yeah. and uh she calls them patches nice so your horse is called patches love it all and right i had a chance to prep everybody that kept giving me questions and i was thinking about this <laughs> I, was thinking more about, I was thinking more about the people relationships he went straight to the horse but wow the <laughs> does it surprise you at all that i want to focus on your pet <laughs> no <laughs> no it would scare me okay so uh just to give you uh take a quick second here guys i just want to give you an idea of what jamin looks like in the event that you have not had a chance to look at the um map uh or that uh, for those listening at home who may not be familiar with uh the shadow world so this is where our campaign is here around the duchy of cloven bay jamin is the continent on which we are adventuring and this is jamin uh i don't uh, oh your matt hansen is the guy who made this map gorgeous map uh of this um, and I, I even like it better than the one in the uh either of the books so you first said it, I thought you said Jaden. And I'm like, you named your son after a role master? <laughs> Where you guys are, the Duchy of Cloven Bay is right here, guys. Okay, if you don't mind, could you show me where my character's from? Is your it the same area? or Your character's actually, away? the monastery of the Changramai Order is actually from Emer, the south across the Straits of Maluria. Oh wow! Okay, yeah, so yeah. I'm far in a secret from home. Cool. Yeah, and yeah. to give context for the uh, Changramai Order too, they are at least ten thousand years old. They date wow. back way to the Second Age of Ire. They've been training monks 
and sending them out as uh, to partially service mercenaries, partially for their own activities and whatnot um, for, I think I said 400 generations. So it's an ancient, ancient, ancient uh, order. The different, uh, you can see there's names to each of the different uh, kingdoms here. These are the six kingdoms that at the end I, actually, you know here, I'll, I'll read off what I've got in the little handout because it's, I try to make it as concise as I can. So this is uh, uh, one of the things I said to know about the kingdom is, uh, or about the uh, setting of uh, Shadow World, that you are heroes in the ruins of kingdoms. So in the mid second age of Ire, roughly 10,000 years ago, six realms dominated the continent of Jaemon. Uh, there was Rakan in the south, Seralus in the northwest, Tanara in the south uh, east, Ulashak, which covers the area where the Duchy of Cloven Bay would be now, uh, Zor in the northeast, and Uralon, an island off the coast that was populated by elves. All the rest of them were dominated by humans, by men. Um, at that time, the rulers of those realms were each gifted a trio of artifacts of fantastic power by the Lore Masters. Lore Masters are one of the powerful organizations that seems to secretly weave their way through the history of all three ages of Ire. These gifts were said to have been forged by the legendary elven smith Tethior, and the three gifts were a crown, a sword, and an amulet that was gifted to each of those six realms. Uh, and this was crafted with the assistance of, by Tethior, with the assistance of the Lore Masters. The crowns were said to have granted the rulers of each realm power such that they could defend their lands with terrible storms, destructive earthquakes, or other natural phenomenon that could shatter invading armies as well as other potent magical abilities with the swords and amulets intended for the most trusted retainers of the rulers. But in the years since, almost all of these objects of power have been lost or destroyed, with only Rakan known to still have a ruler, an emperor, with his nation's crown, the Phoenix crown, in his possession. Although rumors say that the elves of Uralon still have the unicorn crown too, but that might just be Rakani propaganda to justify their many losses after centuries of war with the elves. Our story takes place in third age or third uh, age of Ire, 6050 in lands that were once part of Ulashak, the realm of the Sea Drake. Though that long lost realm had been fractured into two kingdoms even before the Wars of Dominion. At the end of the Second Age of Ire, more than 6,000 years ago, and it has only splintered further in the sixth millennia in the Third Age of Ire. The last king of Helisa. Helisa is a kingdom that is centered right around here on the old capital of Ulishak called Sinar. Helisa is all around here. It is the largest domain left, and it is a successor to a successor state to a successor state. Um, the last king of Helisa, a southern successor uh, kingdom to Ulishak, centered around the capital of Sinar, died more than 50 years ago with the last known heir of the throne of the Sea Drake, Prince Kir Ianus, disappearing immediately afterwards. Since the lost Sea Drake Prince has not resurfaced in the intervening decades to claim his throne from the cult of the Sea Drake, a religious order dedicated to the dark and primal power of the sea, uh, who have been governing Helisa as regents, it's assumed that the line of the Sea Drake has joined that of the other lost nations, now bereft of the families that ruled their nations for more than 400 generations. Seralus, completely gone. Zor, an irradiated and scorched wasteland with no sign of any actual kingdoms or uh, uh, settlements. Uralon has retreated into secrecy and uh, hiding in the forests of that nation. Tanara, the last of the Cloud Lords, who rode effectively like, imagine, they're called Steerdan. Imagine like draft horses or war horses that are Pegasi. Disappeared 
into their mountains. And only the Rakan remain. Everything else has fallen in the intervening years, either during the uh, Wars of Dominion or shortly thereafter. Uh, while your collective home, the Duchy of Cloven Bay, is more than 100 miles outside the border of Helisa, among the warlords and minor kingdoms that arose from the wreckage of Su Liak, the northern successor state, the influence of Helisa is felt by all settlements on the Bay of Ulor, as is the growing power of the city-state of Saral to the north, whose king claims to have recovered the lost wyvern crown of Seralis from the haunted ruins of Turak. Turak is in here. Uh, anyone who's got any levels in history, you would of course know that that city was burned to the ground by demons 8,000 years ago. So that'll give you an idea of where you are. Uh, the Owen oh, Placidar. This is the Pirate Isle of the Dark Elves. Zartrodak's father, the whew, Tavar, the uh, <laughs> black-hearted, Tavar is said to come from there. So, where you are riding here, though, that is the grand scheme. That is not a concern of yours. You are just needing to worry about getting yourself into Cloven Bay and meeting up with your brother. So, and of course the twins and the twins as well. That's uh, not something you're looking forward to seeing as well. I'll, I'll let you consider how you feel about Zartordak Zart and Zartokrik. Um, but let's cut scenes, guys. Uh, while we leave uh, Sir Kira getting herself ready with patches to pack up and, and uh, make the ride in to Cloven Bay, we cut to a cloud-filled sky. And through one of those clouds, <laughs> passes a flying airship. Uh, this, of course, is the Lady Fair. We can see that written on the side. And striding across the deck, uh, we would see, let's say, Jawar to start with. So, Jawar, you would know uh, you are about uh, maybe f five hours, six hours off from arriving at Cloven Bay. What you can see below you is the coast of the Bay of Ulor. So this is the um, eastern edge of the Bay of Ulor, the massive body of water uh, that uh, dominates uh, western uh, Jaemon. Let me show you a quick illustration here to get an idea. This is what you can picture for the western coast of the Bay of Ulor. Shrouded in mist, covered in wild... Um, jagged rock and carpets of evergreen forests that rise up into waiting mountains. So, Jawar, you obviously have. Um, uh, well, I don't know, so why do you think you're you're on deck here? It's still, quite a couple of hours before you get there. What you, um, what's your day looking like what, uh, on a day-to-day -day basis on the Lady Fair? Yeah, I think that my... Um, it's whatever the captain asked me to do, obviously, but um, I think that mostly I'm not doing a lot while we're flying. Like, that's sort of a lot of the, you know, sort of free time that I'm left with because there's not a lot of personal protection that the captain needs while we're flying. Yeah, And, you know, maybe that's actually sort of a time when he likes to have... You know, he likes to be in command and not have me sort of hanging around behind him all the time. Maybe it started when I first worked for him. I would always be, you know, standing behind him, shadowing him on the ship. And finally, he's just like, you know, you're just free to go about the ship. And, you know, he got annoyed with it. So yeah. now I sort of, um, maybe I would spend a lot of my time, um, re you know, practicing my, my, my training, meditating, but also um, enjoying the view, like okay. trying to seem like I'm, you know, doing my monk things, but at the same time, always choosing a spot on the ship where I have a good view and, uh, sure. you know, it's, it's, it's just peaceful and nice, right? When it's, you're with your physical capabilities too, like scrambling up and down the, um, the rigging uh, of the airship as well to the lady fair would be uh, like a, a matter of child's play. It would be, uh, you know, uh, anyone else walking upstairs, 
Right. So, you know, maybe I'm sitting, yeah, exactly. Sitting up on the sails or whatever with sure. a nice view. And uh, I, I pictured Jawar, um, like a lot of sort of these heavily trained monk characters. He's sort of a man of few words, um, unless it's in the right setting. Um, he's more a man of action. So a lot of times I'll be describing more of what he's doing and what he's up to than necessarily what he's saying or who he's conversing with, right? So I think that um, at this point, Kevin would, the stuff that I know would Captain Zadek have already shared that with me because um, yes, everything that you've been told thus far, you have. Okay, so then I would be definitely um, mentally preparing for a lot of that and sure. for, you know, sort of the changes to my regiment. Maybe I'm, um, at this point, if I'm, you know, meditating or whatever, I'm trying to imagine um, what Sarah Kara is going to be like, what kind of a person is she? Yeah. Um, okay. That kind of thing. Um, John, was you were asking about, uh, well, you've got a pretty interesting special ability. Uh, were you thinking of, of kind of skulking around near here? Uh, well, I think that's how Zart would enter into the, because uh, he he was born from a notorious Sky Pirate, or so the legends go. Not a Sky um, Pirate. Uh, or... The Sky Pirates are different. Oh, the okay. the Pirates of uh, Placidar are um, the, are, are like, Seas, they they ply the seas. The seas. Okay, yeah. yeah. So Zard is very comfortable in like the moisture heavy area because of his, you know, liquid alteration skill. Um, I think when Jawar walks out onto the deck, he sees a, a black cat at the helm, just uh, tail twitching, walking back and forth, and green eyes stare at him from the shadows as he approaches. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then they just the cat seems to merge in the shadows, and Zard Ordok just strides out to meet him. <laughs> okay. So you can okay. see uh, Jawar seems to have been lurking uh, and staring longingly out at the forests for, you know, uh, you guys have been traveling this coast now for about uh, two days. And the, Jawar's never been here before, right? As far as you know, no. Uh, so yeah, so like this, this is sort of out of the way. The uh, <laughs> you, you, I think you guys have been to Sinar uh, before. You've been to the port. At least Jawar has been to the port of Sinar before. Um, this far north, no. There's nothing to see up here. Like, what is there? Seralis has been a uh, like a wasteland for you know <laughs> since the end of the uh, Second Age of Ire. It's just warlords living out here. Like, there's what the hell is there to see? Yeah, he basically uh, he makes no attempt to keep his cat form a secret. I mean, he, he shows okay. it off all the time. Okay. Um, but he like strides up to go shoulder to shoulder with Jawar and says, and he just points his staff over and says, "We near my home." And then he lowers his voice and says, "And the many secrets it holds." Hmm. Yeah, he kind of your, kinda, your kinda, secrets, my secrets, Ventier secrets, many secrets. And uh, he kind of stares wistfully out the, and toward the horizon because okay. he is eager to get home. So then you can hear from behind, uh, there's sort of a like a uh, scratching of um, boot on the uh, uh, on the uh, wooden planks that make up the deck. And uh, standing behind you is Captain Zedek Lavar. And he says... Uh, <laughs> Sorry, boys, I'm not interrupting anything, am I? Never. Only wistful daydreams, or with the clouds, it could be anything. How long has it been for you then, Nightwolf? Eight? Eight or more years? Hmm. And? Well, so what advice, and he, he kind of puts his hand on your shoulder, Jawar. What advice do you have for Jawar to prepare himself for Myrna Doom? Well, from what I remember, Kiara is a, uh, a handful. But um, bears, animals, nothing I think your fists can't handle. You see, Jawar, nothing to worry. You see a bear, punch it. Yes, I will be running. <laughs> I don't think they have much taste for uh, cats anyway, 
uh, or Dak. Uh, Jawar, you seem uneasy. Bit of nervous energy. She'll be gone by the time we land. Indeed. If it helps, uh, you have your burden to carry. I do mine. I don't relish breaking bad news uh, to Lord Ventier. Um, Nightwolf, uh, um, or uh, or that he kind of he smiles and grins and he just waves his hand across his face and you see Halen's visage passed over him briefly, and then it goes away and he says, "I could pretend, but." Such deceptions are beyond me. Captain Zedek's face kind of gets, he gets quite angry. And he says, never do that again. Not before Lord Ventier. Never. Uh, not even I am that old. Uh, this, this will be a wound that only family can deliver. <sighs> they are family. I hope... I hope that it is not a mortal one for him. Uh, he has lost much. And you can kind of see there's a bit of a... You can see that clearly what he's speaking of is not only Lord Vinci's loss, he seems to also be speaking of his own. Uh, there's definitely... A, it's His voice is kind of heavy with emotion. And then he catches himself and says, well then, in any event, still several hours... You sure you do, don't wish to change your mind, Ordak? You're intent on coming back? I was surprised to see you at the docks. Well, despite my distance the last several years, I would never send my brother here alone. Hmm. And besides, you have your own burdens to deal with. Do not take ours and our choices on your own shoulders. Indeed. Then... Enjoy the view. Uh, you'll be on the ground for a time, Jabbar. But and he puts his hand on your shoulder once again. It will not be forever. Nothing is. He nods and turns and, and uh, heads back. And I, oh, I naturally, uh, yeah, I was just gonna say, I naturally follow him. And uh, when he turns, I say, "Oh, I have something to say to him, Captain." I must ask one last time before we arrive. Are you certain that I am never to tell Ser Kara what you told me? He um, has a pained look on his face and says, and right before he can speak, I just, I know that if it were me, I would want to know as tough as it is. This will be a challenging development for Lord Ventier to accept and I expect that he will blame the boy's uncle for his desire to find his fortune with the merchant barons among the clouds than to return to serve his duty. I would not... I should not have told him. And I will not make that mistake with Sir Chiara. I understand. I will... I will keep your secret. Um... If yeah. And he, what he says uh, before you can say, he says, and that's to you as well, or Dak. He looks down at the cat that is <laughs> lurking near him. <laughs> How did you guess? Yeah. <laughs> you will keep that secret, uh, or not even your father will keep you safe from my wrath. If a cat's eyes could roll, they would be. Okay. Then... That right before the scene shifts, you see Ordag jump back up on the uh, banister and his eyes fixed from the horizon down to the water. And just uh, the phrase, nothing lasts forever, goes through his head. And he says, he thinks in his mind, except for the elves. And he looks like he's looking for something. Mm -hmm. So with that, um, Captain Zedek 
and uh, he starts walking, and then he turns around. Uh, did you follow him again, uh, Jawar? I think, like, naturally for a couple of steps, but then, um, he, you know, maybe the captain is about to look over his shoulder, and he re remembers, and he's, you know, off to... Yeah. I think he's going to go off, and, you know, um, maybe he's got a, a post or something that he, he trains against to sort of... Sure. Like he said, let off this nervous energy before arriving. So I think what you see, uh, Zartordak, is as he's moving back in, he stops and he turns, and you can see that there is an expression that... Um, it's a, like, bittersweet, melancholic look that he's, uh, Captain Zedek is looking back at uh, Jawar. You've known that Jawar has been for, um, if you've spoken to Jawar at all, what was it, the last five years, Jeff, or was it longer than that? Uh, that I've been with the captain? Yeah. Yeah, I think you've said five years, something yeah. like that. It was quite a long time, yeah. He's been his bodyguard for the last five years across, you know, all the ports of Emer, Jamer, uh, Emer, uh, Jamin, uh, and the other the surrounding uh, wilder uh, seas. So uh, it's almost as if he's finally having to say goodbye to his uh, constant companion. He turns and heads inside. Uh, we yeah, cut... Uh to, um, we'll do one more scene, guys, then we'll take our mid-session break. Uh, so, we cut now to uh, Lady Kiera making her way, clop, 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 mounted on um, patches and making her way towards, now where is that? Yes. I have a title, you will use it. <laughs> oh, Sir Kiera, forgive me. Sir, she's a sir, and she's wearing armor right now. She's <laughs> just teasing. She's ready. Okay, you will show me due respect, Madison. Jeez. Respect my station. Okay. And the... Yes. So this is, I wanted to give you an idea of what the trail to Myrna Doom, or from Myrna Doom to... Uh, um, Cloven Bay would look like. This is what you're riding through. Right through that pile of bandits on the left. <laughs> so you're riding along on your own, and uh, Sir Kiera, how do you feel when you know you're having this kind of freedom? Uh, you're you're free to ride as fast or as slow as you as you like. Oh yeah, it's refreshing. She doesn't have anybody around. She can let the horse go and. She's not going to let it run totally out of control because she doesn't want it to get hurt. But at the same time, she knows that uh, Hatches likes to let her rip a little bit. Okay. So. so you're making even better time, <laughs> you know, charging down. Uh, there is uh, near when you get to the sort of the halfway point. It's really like where the lower foothills uh, start, uh, you know, from the more difficult trail up to Myrna Doom. Uh, there is a, um, a cabin uh, that is used by like in bad weather if you need to do make the the trip in two trails, or if the pass leading up to Murder Dooms proves to be impassable, this is where you sort of winter. Uh, so it's it's what you know because you've traveled it so many times. It's absolutely you know you're near, more than halfway there, and the uh, sun is uh, uh, is barely you know past its uh, its zenith. So you're you know thinking you're making terrific time. You know that there's a um, a bridge coming up that leads across a, a small creek that you'll be, you know, able to start charging across. Would you kindly give us, we'll make our first roll of the uh, session, would you kindly give us a uh, perception check, please? A weather roll. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> nice, okay. So you're riding along, and, well, yeah, weather roll, exactly. <laughs> yeah. What you can see, um, which kind of catches your eye, because it's a little, you know, curious, there are a pack of probably about six or seven ravens. They're all circling over uh, to the left, just as you're, you know, you can see them over the uh, the uh, the uh, the e arms of the trees that you're kind of riding around. And then as you approach the bridge, it, it opens up to the bank of this thing. And you can see there are those, all those uh, ravens circling around overhead. And you don't need to make a, f um, you know, nature or a uh, fauna or flora check, you know that these things seem to keep themselves over um, their scavengers. 
easy way of seeing where there's a, a prey that's being dropped by some, uh, you know, predator or something like that. Uh, and below you, as you're riding up, you can see the stream. And it's um, not rapids or anything like that, but it's a beautiful, uh, you know, uh, beautiful um, runoff from um, somewhere, you know, you know, up in the old home mountains. Would you quickly, I think with a roll that good as well, as you're riding along, you know, you approach the bridge and this bridge is ancient as well. Uh, you know, it was uh, part of um, the thing that was refurbished by the uh, uh, Namari, the dwarves who came to assist your father to rebuild Myrna Doom. So it's just sturdy as shit. You can hear clunk, 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 as you're going across. But as you're getting near the far side, because of the vantage you've got on top of patches, you can see a curious marking on the stones below. You've seen your share of combat, either in actual, you know, that time uh, two winters ago where you drove off the Circa Car Raiders, in the um, you know mishaps that occur when you're at tournaments or in grand melees, one of the rocks seems to have a spray of blood, dried blood for sure, across it. Almost as if something hit it or something struck it. And you can also see right near there, there is a boot print on the light gray stone at the side. Well, even if she was going to ignore the Icarian, which doesn't doesn't make sense in some ways, like they'll circle, but they're, they're carrion birds, they'll go and eat, unless there may be something that was keeping them from eating. Um, but now this blood and the boot print, definitely worth uh, investigating, so I think she'll rain patches in and dismount. Okay, so you to, 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 to get to the side and, uh, of the get thing. A little closer. Lead him by, lead him by, uh, um, on foot, so she can get closer to see what's okay. going on. So you stop and you dismount, uh, and the path that leads from the bridge, like the end of the, the far side of the bridge, the um, uh, western edge of the bridge. Uh, leading down is probably a, a slope that leads down about 20 feet. And then it is sort of scree along the side. The Like a lot of mountain streams or, or rivers, uh, it's mostly rocks around at least this part of the thing that uh, are around it, uh, around around the edges or the um, banks of the, uh, of the creek. From where you are to get down to there is probably about uh, maybe 20, 25 feet as you make your way down, leading patches behind you, you sort of realize that this mark may have come from not far from where the, the bridge is. Hmm. If someone jumped or fell perhaps down here, they may have clipped themselves on this. Does it look like, um, you know, like, I, does she get an idea maybe that it, it, the path is getting narrower or does she maybe leave patches back or? Um, you should be able to lead uh, him along here. Uh, it is, oh, we lost your camera, Dave. Let me hit refresh. Reconnect. There we go. I lost, so, I lost you guys too. Oh, okay, yeah, we got you back now. I got you back at least. So why don't you, um, let's see here. You'll, you'll be fine leading um, her along. Would you give us a tracking check, though? So, uh, this will be a static maneuver that you're uh, doing. So you just need a 100. Oh, yeah, and guy, a reminder, guys, we're playing with Astonishing Fortune. You guys will have six points of Astonishing Fortune. You can spend it to re-roll your roll, uh, or to not die, or you can spend it to add 2d10 to the result of one of the d100 rolls. Oh, wow. Okay. So, um, what you can see is that there probably is, with a roll that uh, that well, uh, Dave, you, you can't quite make out a path here, but you can tell that there are boot prints uh, that have gone along here. Give us a weather watching uh, roll as well. 
I know you're not great with weather watching, but let's just see here. I just thought you were going to ask me to roll the weather. <laughs> There's that 100. <laughs> not great with the weather. Fine. Unbelievable. Today, Unbelievable. All right. So you know, here's what you know is that the um, the boots in here, um, or the, the prints that are in here, there's a couple of them around this area as if someone was kind of moving around, but you can't make out any further sense of it. But what you can tell from your weather watching roll is that it rained about five days ago, which means that these tracks have to be four days or less old. Hmm. You know what? This is enough. Uh, I think she's going to uh, tell Patches to sit quiet and she's going to strap on her shield okay. and untie the peace knot on her sword. And No, I probably wouldn't be tied because she, she wouldn't be going in to talk to any mobility. So, uh, yeah, so she's going to have her uh, shield up and then she'll take the reins again and okay. carry on. So you start making your way along, and as you you make your way along the bank uh, for about maybe two, three minutes, um, you can hear the sound of the wind blowing through the pines around. You can hear the sound of the water lapping beneath. You can hear the Do sound... Think this is like in the proximate direction of the ravens? You're actually walking directly towards the ravens. The ravens seem to be circling not far from where you are, and uh, you would guess on the northern, uh, on the uh, western bank of this creek as well. As you get, you're getting closer, you know, you're sort of looking up at where the ravens circle to down. Patches is <laughs> a little upset by something or disturbed by something. Easier. To do like an animal handling or something? You can, you can if you like. You actually have a plus, uh, because he is so well trained, you're going to get plus 20 to all of your riding or animal handling things. So make a riding check. That'll be controlling the animal. Uh, now, normally you get a penalty when you're wearing your armor. 145, though. Fuck, no. So you turn in like a master... Um, you know, uh, master cavalry, uh, cavalry soldier. What do you, what do we see you do to calm him down completely? Uh, I think it's uh, uh, she switches the reins into her shield hand, and just with her leather glove, just kind of like suits him on the side of the head, and and just kind of leaves her hand there for a moment while she's looking around, and he kind of just like calms, just kind of absorbs her her calm energy. Yep. So then you turn and continue on your progress. The reins in one hand, your shield up, your sword out. And as you sort of walk around, what you can see is that there are, um, and it sort of comes into view. So uh, this, what you're seeing would be about maybe um, 50 feet away from you, a little more. And it seems that on the Northern bank, there are a, uh, or there is a, um, like a, a kind of gr uh, orangish gray fox that is pulling away at something. And it looks like it's white and bloated. And it takes you a moment to realize that what you're looking at is a human carcass that seems to have grown wedged into the side the, of this bank. It looks like some trees got caught up when in uh, earlier in the spring. Uh, this is downstream, so it would have been carried down here. Mm. But it seems as if the ravens are circling overhead in deference to this fox, which is picking at this body. The body is white and bloated and quite picked over as well. I think she'll just uh, draw her sword and smack it on the shield a couple of times, trying to get sure. the fox's attention and drive it off. Sure. So the fox, its first snaps, looks up at you, and then kind of waits to see if you approach. If you take even a single half step towards it, it bolts off yep. into the woods. And then she'll approach the uh, 
Actually, you know what? She'll just um, probably has like a command or something for Patch to just stand there, do nothing. So sure. Just... With a roll that good, yeah, yeah, you absolutely can just. Patches will stay. Yeah, and then she'll just approach the body and she'll probably put her sword away so she can get a better look. Or sure. So one thing, uh, just this, your character doesn't need to necessarily know this, but uh, one of the ways that uh, Rollmaster differs from, uh, say, Dungeons and Dragons, is that almost every single kind of undead has the ability to basically just, it sucks in your constitution. It drains life from just being in its presence. From the lowest, you know, wa wandering skeleton up to the most powerful, like, you know, risen, uh, undead, uh, wizard king, right? What kind of Friday game would it be if Kevin doesn't drain in my con? Well, the reason I mention that is because, you know, like, there's, it is clearly evident if an undead spirit has entered into something, you would know that. You know, oh, it's, okay. uh, so, like, this is, well, this is, and it course. probably wouldn't be letting a fox sit there and eat it. Quite true. Quite true. So as you make your way a little closer towards, you see that this body has been stripped down to what's left of a soaken uh, loincloth. You have first aid, I think, right? Yes. Okay. So let's make a... Hold on here. Mm. <laughs> let's try and heal it. No, I'm going to see if you can tell how long the body's been here. Uh, from its body, but it's going to be a difficult thing with first aid. Um, you know, John, necromancers are just clerics with bad timing. <laughs> necromancers uh, also class out of Rollmaster Companion 2. <laughs> oh, look at that. <laughs> Good, I'm going to have the same distaste for them as I do in the other games. <laughs> Would you... Let me see here. Sorry, Dave. I'm just trying to find the uh, modifiers chart here. Here we go. Here we go. Um... Let's see here. Here we go. General things. I'm going to make this hard. Give us a minus... Uh, uh, perception... Or sorry, perception. Uh, first aid check at minus 10, please. How do you put in the minus? Do we just... Uh... Oh, with, oh, I can't remember if the skills prompt you for a modifier or not. Oh, oh I don't think so. Holy shit. <laughs> you guys are masters of old master. So, as you make your way... Uh, towards it. what you can tell is like this is something that has been in the uh, like in the water. I don't know why you know you know why you would know this is because of all your time spent at Cloven Bay. You've been around dead bodies that have been in the water for too long when you've been sailing around the Bay of Ulor. Uh, so this thing has for sure been in here for at like four days makes sense. So if it corresponds with when the water would have come, and also like with the rain, the rain would have forced the creek to rise which means that the body may not have gotten stuck then as well but it's not wearing clothes it's not wearing clothes and it's also subject to if you get close enough it is subject to a bunch of um uh, like you know animal bites and whatnot there's probably insects that have got into this as well um the face is hanging to its side and the eyes have been removed, no doubt, thanks to the ravens for it too. But you can see that there is a clearly what is a weapon wound that is cut along its throat. You know oh, the, the this, scent of a blade. This was no accident. No, and as you're looking at it too, with a roll that good, there's something sticking out, but it's not a... It's not a bone. The back of the head as well, too. Massive uh, thing. Like the, the wound that you saw, or the mark you saw on the stone, easily could have been made by the force, the massive kind of crushed in part you can see on this head. Right. It looks like there's something sticking out. Definitely not bone. From where? From that wound. From within that wound. The one benefit of it being in the water so long is this washed out any blood or any other kind of stuff that's in there. Um, I think she'll draw her dagger. Okay. And, uh, show dagger? I thought she had a dagger. Yeah, you, I think you have a fine steel dagger, yeah. Yeah, fine steel dagger. Um, I think she'll, um, just kind of prod at it a little bit, see if, 
you know, she opens it up. If Easily. Uh, do, you, do you choose, do you want to, you could push this thing out. It's a bit of metal that's stuck in there. Looks like a bit of a, a weapon that may have broken off or stuck in there or something. Okay, it's, so just cut around it, cut loose, yeah, and then... It's easy to get out because it's only about, like, maybe this long. And what it is, is you can't fathom. It's broken on two sides, but it goes from about here to about there, and there are jagged, like, teeth on one side, but it's curved so much that would it would probably curve back in on itself. Why don't you give us a lore uh, history yeah. check? And we'll give you a minus 10 on this one, too, because I think this might be a little hard. Do we know of any, like, tribes folk that use any sort of unique weapons, or...? Uh, there can, I mean, there are some wild folk, uh, that are said to lurk in the, in the, uh, you know, deeper in the woods and stuff like that. None of them would use something like this, though. His history check, you said? Please, yeah. At minus 10, oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> you guys are amazing at this game. Uh, uh, well, these are all story props, so Roll20 is playing well with us. Wait, yeah! yeah. So like you take death. this... Get invested. And I think what you do is looking, you know, you, you, a little further back from where the stones are is where the sand would start, right? Like the, Or the mud around this thing. And you place it down and you put an indentation in. Then you take it out and put it down again and again and run it around. And what you can see it forms roughly, it's not quite an approximation, is a circular weapon with jagged stars out on every mm. side. This is a shuriken. And you've huh. heard, these are weapons uh, that are only used. They are only effective in the hands of a select few martial arts masters. The okay, so Changramai, the legendary Changramai monks, for instance, uh, are a type that would, uh, where these would become lethal. Uh, like the shuriken are otherwise at best uh, a distraction, at worst, shitty caltrops in the hands of anyone else. But yeah. this seems to be someone who was killed with a single shuriken stroke, or at the very least, disabled to the neck. Wow. And then. Okay, so she's going to pocket the remnant of the weapon. And um, is there any way to, like, there's no there's no items on this person. There's no clothing. Obviously, there's no emblemage. You can tell from the... Um, the lineage or... Yeah, the... the, F, the, the uh, so, uh, one of the things with... Um, with a very, very, very long history of Shadow World. Like, the first Age of Ire is kind of a... It's the time of the Lords of... of um, the Lords Arcane. Uh, so it's sort of a time of legend and mystery and whatnot. Not much is known about that. The second Age of Ire is the rise of mankind, but that lasted about 6,000 years. This is another 6,000 years. So in the 12,000 years of history of the rise and fall of different organizations and uh, empires and whatnot too, and the, the free flowing of people, the levels of technology in Shadow World are dramatically, uh, they're very, they vary a great deal. So there may be, you know, uh, running the gamut from what would be equivalent to dark age of our, you know, uh, of our history in some regions all the way up to you know, um, the uh, 17th or even 18th century uh, level of technology with firearms and sailing. Uh, tons of movement of people all over the place. What so, it also means, the what yeah. this is, is uh, the coloring of this person's hair is darker and the features are more refined, I think, or more delicate. You would guess this person is uh, like a Jameri uh, kind of commoner, or someone maybe with a little bit of. Uh, um, it's probably someone from the south. You would guess. I'm gonna check his hands to see if they're calloused, or if there's a working person. Yeah, you see. So take a look at the hands, and they're definitely not calloused, but curiously, there are stains on them, ink stains. Stains. Having grown up in uh, Myrna Doom around oh. scholars and secrets of it, you know this is a badge of honor 
for a uh, dedicated scholar. You've seen your, your father's very hands look like this as well. There's often people who make their way, uh, you know, to and from um, elsewhere in the world to come study at Myrna Doom or to contribute to uh, Myrna Doom to the library there. So this could be uh, someone who was traveling up here. From where you are as well, you realize that there looks like there are a couple of other ravens sitting on a rock about 100 or 150 feet downstream too. Uh, okay. I'm going to uh, carry on towards the ravens, but I'm going to whistle for Patches. Okay. Patches oh. comes trotting over. What you see is, uh, we're not going to go through the, the whole uh, scene again. There are two other corpses. Similar that, marks? Identical marks, same ethnicity, uh, not the same spot necessarily, but definitely the result of violence. Okay. And all of them have those same markings on their hands. These are all scholars stripped down to their loincloth and then cast into the river. Well, I don't want to spend too much time out here because the time that I was making, I've now lost. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess she's going to... Uh... So in terms of uh, how you handle uh, corpses and stuff like that, uh, the I mentioned that the um, the monastery that is present at Myrna Doom is run by the uh, the uh, Sisters of Isa, the, who is the also known as the Keeper of Souls. Keeper of Souls is the goddess of death, uh, winter, and um, the underworld. These, you should be mad if I just leave these here. Uh, they wouldn't be mad, but I mean, like, uh, what? I'm not sure what would be expected of you. It's something that they would not want to leave the bodies out here, but I'm not sure that it would be expected that you would stack four, three adult bodies onto the, your horse and then. Yeah, and well, not just it. So, like, if uh, when there was only one corpse, that was actually something I'd considered. Is Sir Kira would be like, okay, well, you know what? I'll take this poor soul into town and yeah, uh, something drop him off at a uh, cemetery, uh, a church, or a monastery, and let somebody do something proper with the corpse. But yeah, now that there's three, like, it's not a pack mule, and I got a road to finish riding down so well and this is i mean it's right at the bridge too so yeah and it's um i can tell you that the, there are times when misfortune befalls those who are coming to myrna dune you know i mean like no place is immune from from all dangers but i'm not sure that in your adult life you've ever heard of anyone being waylaid on the way to myrna dune and you certainly haven't heard of anyone going missing in uh, the last couple of weeks. That would be news for um, uh, for the place. Okay, well, she's going to uh, leave patches out of the trees, and once we get back close enough to the, to the road or to a path that she figures she can ride, she's gonna hop up and okay. get back on the road. Awesome. All right, so you go racing down, um, uh, and you will be finally approaching um, Cloven Bay. So, guys, let's do this. Let's take our mid-session break right now, and then we will come back and cut back in on the crew of the Lady Fair. Uh, so, for those listening at home, we'll be back uh, momentarily.
All right, I'll check in with chat. Hi, everybody. Hope the weekend is off to a great start for everyone. Uh, TXC, howdy, howdy. Crumb, what's going on? Uh, not a Middle Earth setting, no, uh, TCB. Uh, the, um, there are uh, supplements for Middle Earth role playing, which is like a streamlined version of Role Master that is set in Middle Earth. Uh, this, this adventure is not, it's set in uh, Shadow World. <laughs> nice Doom Bunny. Hope you're having a great weekend. Yeah, my hope is that Wolf was magically teleported to this lush world that we all be reunited very soon. <laughs> nice. Yeah, and I'll share. Uh, Drac, what's going on? Hope your weekend's doing well. <laughs> Definitely check for Chuck Norris. Yep, that's always suspect. <laughs> all right. Uh, what I can do while we're waiting for Dave is I'll get the thing set up that I got for. Uh, Cloven Bay. Just gonna reconnect to see if I get Dave's camera back too. No, oh, did you lose his camera too? <laughs> yeah, I went. There we go. <laughs> oh, I got everybody. Nice. I like to see their faces. A hundred percent agree. Hundred percent agree. Okay. Well, they're only tiny, but you can still get facial reactions. Yep. Um, I had my uh, third jab yesterday, and the only side effect I had was um, like my, my uh, arm was quite sore. Still is a little sore today too, um, but I uh, <laughs> I also had uh, I watched five episodes of uh, the Haunting at Hill House. Uh, yesterday. Yeah, I saw your tweet about it. Fuck. I had like the worst nightmares I've had in years. I'm not no. sure it was it was the uh, uh, the reaction to the vaccine uh, or what, but like I genuinely had to sleep with the lights on uh, at one point last night. I'm like, fuck it, like I'm sick of w waking up and freaking out. Thank God that Anna was there. <laughs> she was just kept snuggling in closer and closer and didn't mind sleeping in the uh, in the light. But oh my God, such a good! I really, really enjoyed that show. Scared the shit out of me. Now, to be fair, Kevin, you know, for all the nightmares you give all our characters, you know, you know, maybe it's <laughs> turn about fair play. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, it's it's only by learning, you know, figuring out what scares the shit out of me, so I can inflict that on you guys, right? So yeah, exactly. Helps you <laughs> make them more realistic. Damn right. All right. So uh, I've got a couple of uh, things that I want to. Uh, is that the one I want? No. Black screen. Uh. Or do I have you guys on a black screen right now? Uh, yes. Okay, give me a second here. I've got a couple of illustrations that uh, I'm going to put down to give you an idea. Because um, Cloven Bay, so the reason that uh, Cloven Bay, I'll wait for Dave to get back and give you the fill in for this. He is here. Oh, yeah, he can hear us. So the um, the reason that Cloven Bay is so named is because there is, uh, it is the um, uh, deepest uh, port in within 100 miles in, in either direction. And uh, it is named as such because it almost as if you took like in the middle of the cliffs, you somehow smash some giant axe down into it and pulled it back. There are big cliffs that, that lead in on the side, but to give you a couple of um, images to give you a sense of what uh, Cloven Bay is like, there's kind of like the keep uh, for the uh, duchy, for the duke, the house of Rinovar. Um, how busy the docks are. So there, it's not half cut. These are fully cloven. <laughs> fully cloven, yeah. yes. Not the half cut hills, no. <laughs> no. All right, where is it here? It, are these all official artworks, Kev, that you've been using? Uh, no, these are things I found on the internet. Oh, okay. The, uh, yeah, there, there's a... Uh, They're just random. I should images. say as well, okay. too, I, I have made um, some, some, as I all often do i have made some substantial changes uh or at least modifications to the setting and, and stuff like that most of this is, it's like 80 percent 90 percent of it is is as descriptive or as descriptive as described in the um uh what do you call it in the the material it's just that the source books for uh shadow world are much closer to like campaign notes or campaign suggestions more so than like actual source books there's yeah, a lot okay. of like some great big you know big picture stuff in there, um, but the particulars are kind of left for you. So this is like Cloven Bay, all the map, the setting of Cloven Bay and Myrna Doom and stuff like that. This is all my own creations. This is all my own 
turns out that uh, creating a, a setting in addition to uh, writing an adventure and characters, it's an awful lot of work. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, it is. Uh, so these are just some ideas to give you uh, of what um, Cloven Bay is like, guys. So depicted in the illustrations here, this is sort of what you could see as you're approaching Cloven Bay. It's a big, uh, massive edifice of uh, uh, the keep of uh, Cloven Bay, and uh, the docks of Cloven Bay are like this, very built up, large, tall sailing ships that uh, make their way, uh, or that uh, find um, uh, anchor in here. Let me make this a little close smaller. There we go. There we go. Uh, but the um, the nature of the architecture and the streets and stuff, they're they're old. Like, uh, while Myrna Doom is recently renovated, Cloven Bay has been here for several generations, at, at the very least, and or at least in the hands of the Rinovar for several generations. This is an old settlement. So the streets are all nice and built up. Um, the buildings are in the, the, the um, deep port at Cloven Bay allows lots of travel back and forth. So there's, uh, and has for quite some time, it's easy for a place to get in and transport things over land or by the river deeper into uh, the, um, uh, the hinterlands. Um, it's allowed them to build up uh, and uh, quite well with a, a fair amount of money behind it as well. And then what you see here, guys, is the, let me move this out of the way. This is the obelisk. And the reason it's named that way is because shortly, like a little ways out of, it's not outside of town, but it's sort of like just on the edge of town. There is a large um, black obelisk that floats there. And that is a ancient magical artifact that is used by the navigators. Navigators are another one of those ancient orders like the lore masters who, um, if you want to, they, they basically facilitate magical travel for those who can afford it all across Jamin and the rest of Shadow World. So if you can afford to have someone teleport you from here to say, Emer, the, the floating city, you can just do that. Um, it's also a, a way of sending uh, messages for those who can afford it too. So what the obelisk serves as is not only kind of a waypoint for people, it's the first place that you could stay if you're transporting that way, um, it's also the effectively like the mail, you know, the postal uh, place for, for the navigators. The navigators are technically a single group, but it's really made up of a bunch of different guilds and stuff that control different parts of the, uh, like cover different areas or different routes, as it were. Uh, they'll take you wherever you want to go, but generally speaking, there are specific guilds that cover, you know, the different parts and they have all, the, all sorts of different uh, bylaws and rules and costs and things like that. Um, but what that does is it gives the uh, the obelisk uh, inn or the tavern uh, even more cachet and even more of a reason to, to kind of be there. So I think what we'll do, and of course that is run by Vartalon, who is uh, Zart or Dak, your half brother. Now you ignore the kind of monster looking thing in the top there, but this is what your half brother looks like. Now you might say, Kev, he's pretty old. Yeah. And I'd say, yeah, he is. Uh, half elves definitely gain the benefit of the extended lifespan of their uh, immortal parents, but they don't live forever. Uh, and as the years take their toll, depending on the individual, they may continue to hide their age the way, or their years the way that uh, elves do, or they may favor their human half as Vartalon has and look old as shit, even though he's <laughs> got elven blood. Well, uh, I am prideful enough and uh, honest enough to admit that I will never look that way because I'm a master of illusions. <laughs> nice. See, I'll kill myself first. All right. So, um, var the, I think this is where um, as you kind of ride into uh, town, uh, Sir Kier, we'll cut to you coming in and uh, tell me where your head's at. What are you thinking as you're riding into town? Now, obviously, there's that the mystery of those bodies that you found on the way in, but you are also, this is the first time you see your brother uh, as an adult, really. You haven't seen him when, when he left. You were, what, 15 or something like that? Younger, Ooh, I think, even. Yeah, it's been younger. Uh, yeah, you're 10 years old 
when he left. Yeah, he, he was just an annoying older brother who blamed me for stuff that I didn't really do and tell me lies about ghosts and shit. So yeah, it's going to be kind of, it's going to be kind of weird, I think. Okay. Kind of not sure who he is and who he's become. So hoping to navigate that and I don't know, get on to relatively good terms as quick as we can and get back to father, I guess. Okay. So the, um, the town of, uh, um, of a uh, Cloven Bay is probably, um, it's probably close to like 5,000 people. Like it's a, it's a big, uh, town. There are farms that are near here as well too, but really the, like the wealth that comes in from, uh, some of the other communities, uh, they're the ones that largely do the farming. And then there is logging and, uh, uh, skins that uh, come in from Myrna Doom. And fishing is a big part of the uh, of the trade as well too. So it's just it's a quite active uh, community. And as you're uh, you know riding your way through here, uh, Sir Kira, to get down to the uh, uh, the docks, even the skyships will uh, dock at the uh, at the port in um, or the wharfs. Uh, y you can hear a familiar uh, voice uh, saying, "Arms, arms for the poor." <gasps> Owns. And you recognize this, and it's not directed towards you, it's towards someone else. And this person has really is known by two different names. Um, one is what most people call him that is Pig Stink. Pig Stink is a Lugroki beggar. Uh, the Lugroki. Uh, you know your histories are said to have been back in the early uh, era of or early um, years of the Second Age of Ire. The Iron Wind and the other servants of the Unlife crossbred elves and demons to breed the Lagroki. Um, the Lagroki are a formidable warrior race. Uh, the, if you're looking for a cognate, the Lagroki are sort of similar to the orcs, but it's they're very they are still quite different from them and in the many 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 years since some of the Logroki have managed to find themselves ways of integrating with society pig stink you know his actual name is garage but everyone else calls him pig stink not for undeserved reasons and garage if you are interested in it and the reason Pink, uh... I think she'll uh, fish out a couple of silvers or something. And... So coinage in this, guys, is actually a little more, uh, again, like in another one of the ways that this is sort of uh, a response to AD&D, coins are a little more, um, they, right. they make a little bit more sense and the cost of things make a little more sense. There was thought put to the economy as opposed to just, you know, uh, from the game perspective. Coins run from mithril uh, all the way down to tin. Uh, mithril, gold, silver, bronze, copper, and tin. And to give you an idea, each of those is uh, increments of 10. And to give you an idea of what a cost would be, uh, a beer here would cost you two tin pieces. And a sword would cost, let's see here, a broadsword would cost two silver pieces. Okay, so I'm not tossing them enough to buy a sword. Yeah. I might throw them 310 and tell him to go get himself a meat pie. Okay, so you toss it in. And uh, we, he's sort of sitting down and he's got one lame leg. And uh, thank you. Thank you. Oh, oh, Lady Kira. Lady Kira. And he, he sort of stumbles up. And he's shambling, trying to get himself up. And you know that um, he has apparently been a contact of Kaya. Kaya is the Herazi, the uh, winged uh, humanoid uh, person who grew up in your in your household as well, too. And he says, have you seen Kaya? <laughs> uh, have I? Yeah, she's back at... You haven't seen her. Yeah. Your, your father sends Kaya off on Tastic. One of the things, because she can fly, um, or they can fly, I should say. We don't know what her gender is yet. Uh, they can fly. She, she, uh, they are a 
a very, very effective spy slash, you know, courier uh, for your father. She can easily cover in an hour, uh, you know, or less than an hour, the distance between uh, Myrna Doom and here. And then to go to other communities is, is uh, equally easy. Um, right. Kaya has also grown into kind of being a, um, you know, because she can get here so quickly and foster uh, allies like that, uh, like uh, Pigsync, they also can get information for your father from them. You know that uh, Pigsync is one of those sources. Do you think you've dealt with uh, Pigsync or Garage uh, before? Uh, yeah, I think um, we'd come here <clears throat> perhaps when we were younger and um, and I think Garage was rudely dealt with by Helen, who's, you know, yep. the heir apparent and you're a stinky beggar, get away from me kind of thing. Um, but she kind of felt bad for him and, you know, kind of like every time she's in town, she'll even maybe detour a little bit if she's sure. got time and try and track him down and make sure he's got some food. Well, Kev, you also said that uh, Sir Kira has been fighting in tournaments and stuff, so that would probably be here, right? Like uh, sometimes capital? here, sometimes in some yeah. of the uh, surrounding things. Once okay. peace was made with um, the uh, uh, with Oakford, the Kingdom of Oakford, uh, there's yeah. been tournaments there as well, too. Okay. And in some of the... Yeah, that's which we'll, we'll get to in a moment. Uh uh, Sir Kira has made an impression on some of the uh, Oak members of the Oakford family. Mm -hmm. um, I don't understand. <laughs> <laughs> so what? And the other thing is, is that the Lugroki are like um, this is a civilized area. If he was uh, found in a smaller community, they may just kill him because the Lugroki are. You know, think of how uh, orcs are seen in other settings. You know, or whatnot too. Yeah. Smaller towns where you can get away with that kind of shit, if you just don't want them there, easy enough, kill them. But this is a more civilized area, and yeah. So anyway, he um, he kind of leans in in a conspiratorial way and says, "Thank you, thank you. I I've got word for it for for Kaya. I've seen things. I've I've heard things." And he kind of points at his his ears. You can see one or two people walk by, kind of wrinkle their nose at him, and ugh. I'll give them a little bit of a glare and then turn back to Garage. Well, you can tell me, Kaya's like a sister. I've, oh, right, not, not here. I've got, we've got that spot down by the wharf. Can we go there? I'll meet you there. You know which place she's talking about. There's a, it's Kaya's sort of like dead drop place or whatever. Yep. Uh, sure. Two hours. Big day for you, though. Your brother's coming home, right? Yep. Yep, and I'm here to meet him. Big day. And probably the twins. Oof. The twins are coming back, too. Mm hmm. Does that mean all Doc's coming back, too? <laughs> well, I, I heard potentially both. I. Don't know for sure. To be oh, 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 oh. Big Kinda day, big day for you then, for sure. It's like it's like getting three brothers back, to be honest. But <laughs> I bet, I bet. All right, I'll see you there. Two okay. hours, say. Two hours. All right. And he kind of wobbles and then slams kind of back against the stone wall and slides down. Puts his little cup out. Thank you. Arms for the poor! Arms for the poor, please! He goes back to, to begging. So, as you um, leave Pig's Think and you're sort of making your last way down towards the dock, you can see, and I... I think you may have seen something like this, maybe... Oh, gosh, maybe like th between three and five other times in your lifetime. Uh, the sky ships. They are not by any means common. Uh, they are something that is run out of only a few different places, in particular, uh, Eidolon, the flying city. Uh, Eidolon is literally a flying city that drifts above a much larger and older metropolis called Selkai. And that place is, it makes any other like trading port or whatnot look like a shithole. 
it is so well known and the, the merchant barons are so well traveled and the skyship captains are so incredible that um, they may they may have come here a couple of times that you've seen, but it doesn't take away from the jaw-dropping experience and the impact that they have on anyone who sees them when they do come to town. And that's what you see drifting down. Now, Jeffrey, why don't you tell us what do you think the Lady Fair looks like? <clears throat> I can give you an idea if you want. So here's sure. there's I, I'm... what Eidolon from the streets of Selkai looks like. Drifting way above there. And I'll give you one. It really looks like, you know, like a seven, the way that they've depicted them in the illustrations is kind of like 17th century um, sailing ships. Like tall ships? Yeah, that's kind of what I imagined, but like a really um, slim version. Mm. Yeah. Um, but still, still large enough that you can tell that there's, you know, it's, it does have carrying some carrying capacity for moving both people and cargo. But uh, yeah, yeah. And you know, honestly, maybe, you know, something you. Maybe the the railings are a little different too because um, you're not out over the water; you're out of the air, right? So, yep. you know, if you fall overboard on a on a sea ship, <laughs> you're not, you know, pretty much instantly dead. But if you fall off of an airship, so maybe like one of the notable things is that like the the railings are slightly higher, and maybe even there's like an extra rope, even you know, yeah, sort of at shoulder height, even above like. The railings yeah, yeah, are way tight, sure. and then like a, you know, so it's sort of extra safe, just because. And I picture that like, um, you know, like uh, airplanes, right? Like the most dangerous kind of part on a skyship is takeoff and landing. So there's like the crew, they're scrambling along. You've got um, uh, the, uh, excuse me, uh, Captain Zedek is out on deck, you know, barking commands at everybody. Jawari and um, uh, Zartordak, uh, you don't have anything really to do at this point, too. So where do we think we see you guys as you're coming in? See, I would be uh, probably trying to stay out of the way, just watching everybody scurry around. Okay. Sticking to the shadows. How does it feel seeing the wharves and uh, the keep at Cloven Bay again after almost a decade? It's, it's strange. Uh, everything seems smaller. Oh, I bet. Yeah, yeah. And Jawar, seeing this place that you're coming to now, uh, after seeing so many other wonderful and amazing things in the course of your five years of travels, uh, how do you feel? Well, I think that um, Jawar normally is on the front of the ship or somewhere where he has a really good view of everything coming in. But I think based on the circumstances, um, he's actually standing where he normally stands, sort of shadowing the captain. Sure. And uh, like I said, normally the captain is annoyed at that and would, would tell him to not be right over his right shoulder. But due to what's up, you know going on, he's sort of tolerating it. And sure. it's sort of their way of um, their unspoken bond, right? So, yeah. He's sort of right behind him and, you know, enjoying the sort of landing process as the captain controls the ship. Yep. So, Sir Kira, what do you think you do uh, when you see this? You know, once I guess, first off, what is your reaction to seeing this thing? Well, I think uh, at first it's kind of a... Uh, it's, it's probably been a few years and lots has probably happened since then. And probably had this idea built up in her head as to what the ship was going to look like based on the last time she saw one and and it's probably like bigger and you know more magnificent than did you see do you think you went to see halen off yeah then this is actually the exact same ship right which is curious the lady fair so i think it's it's bigger in reality than what she remembers, even though you'd think that, you know, growing up would make it smaller, but she's yeah. kind of diminished it in her mind. Um, but also it looks more worn. Like it, yep. it's not as grandiose as it was. It's <clears> just, <throat> it's just a big tub. And she's like, it's still beautiful, but it's, 
like she can see scratch marks and stuff where it's like had you know a little extra wind on docking and stuff like that and it's like maybe it's gotten into a scrape or two and mm -hmm. she's like it's not as pretty as i thought i remember it was but it sure is big and yeah, it's mm -hmm. still pretty, still kind of beautiful and as she's admiring the ship she's like oh right Halen's gonna be here okay uh what am i gonna say to him and she starts like changing back into like okay i gotta be the dutiful sister i gotta like welcome him home i gotta take him to father hopefully we'll have a private conversation about how we're going to work together and i'll be there to support him and all the things that he's going to do when he takes over and uh do i really want to have these conversations and she's going through all this in her head what do you think your family crest looks like um it's probably like the watchtower mm. yeah um with a, a waterfall beside it oh love it yeah 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 cool and uh so i think the watchtower is probably like white or to represent silver yep. and um, and then that kind of like blue water in behind it and then a little bit of green and then blue sky. So it's kind of like the white mm -hmm. on the colors. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's probably some like some Chevron, maybe a, a, in a different quadrant, they'll have like maybe two Chevron sure. quadrants. Here. So I think I changed my mind. I think that the way this will, there is a tower that's sort of built up here, but it's a wooden thing and it's really like, it's clear that it, it was built to be sturdy, but it is not used very often. So this thing drifts down and kind of docks with this um, this sky dock, as it were. And there's people who are scrambling. There's uh, stevedores and other sort of uh, wharf workers. And I even, because I found this just a, a really great um, picture. Here's what uh, your average dock worker would look like, guys. <laughs> So you picture these guys scrambling around, working Those away, nice you know. Nice shoes. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, gotta, I gotta up my DM game, guys. Kev's got dock workers. <laughs> I know. So what, well, you know, because it's such an unusual, you know, technology setting, I really wanted to make sure we captured that for, uh, for this. So it docks and you guys are beginning to disembark. I think um, uh, Captain Zedek leads it, leaves it to his kind of like first officer or whatever, or whatever the, I, I, I don't know anything <laughs> about nautical things. Uh, whatever the person <laughs> is who would do sort of handle the, uh, uh, what do you call it? Handle the uh, disembarking or whatnot. Um, he's gonna head down. Uh, he kind of looks at you, uh, Jawar, and you, uh, or Dak, and he, Crick is going to join as well, too. He'll just be very, very quiet. And if um, you haven't seen uh, guys, what uh, the twin brother, Zarda Crick, looks like is... Whoops, let me go. This. White hair, but otherwise very similar looking to uh, Zarda or Dak. So... Um, Captain Zedek kind of turns and uh, at the top of this sort of uh, disembarking sky dock. And uh, Jawari, would you give us a perception check, please? I'll give you a plus 20 to this as well, because you know Captain Zedek quite well. Is it prompt for that? No, okay, no, it doesn't. So okay, so that's an 80. Uh, so Ooh, that's he, pretty bad roll. it's not. I mean, it's not great. It's 80, like about eighty percent of success. So I think you see Captain Zedek pause for a moment, and then kind of carry forward. Uh, a sixty doesn't tell us. You don't know, learn enough. I guess we like we're in the last forty-five minutes of the session. You want to spend a point of astonishing fortune? Yeah, let's do it. Okay. <laughs> It'd be cool if there was a either a prompt or a. a Modifier place, but mm -hmm. it's okay. Wait, perception. Uh, oh, there we go. Okay, so he, you can see his shoulders kind of slump, and you, you, this is all in the span of like he's he does a really good job normally of, of hiding. Uh, you know, he's got a great poker face, as it were. He, he hides his reactions and whatnot quite well, particularly you know, uh, between the crew. You can see that there's a bit of like there's a task he's not looking forward to doing. Uh, you know, there's that pause of like, all right, let's get this over. And then you see him walk forward. And I'm not sure that you've seen him do that before. 
He's mm. a decisive, fearless captain, you know, <laughs> even in the face of uh, danger, you know, from uh, all the things you've seen over the course of your many travels. This may very well be the task he's the least um, looking forward or least uh, um, eager to face. Mm. Maybe there's some kind of a, um, a, a thing that Jawar does where he uh, either straightens. I was like thinking like crack his knuckles, but like something like that it probably wouldn't be crack his knuckles, but would be like um, a straighten his gi or, or, or something. But it's got this sort of loud snapping sort of cloth sound to it. Yep. And he does it. Yeah. And he does it like as a support thing to show the captain, like, I'm right behind you. I'm sort of here with you. Yeah. Like, it's <laughs> more it. of a like, that's the way he would express, like, I'm here with you kind of yeah, thing. Yeah. So with that snap, he sort of looks over your shoulder and you look, you know, you're, yeah, and your hood pulled up, like, yeah. Nod. He kind of, uh, once again, gets that wry smile on his face and, um, nods you guys head down uh i think you probably would have arrived uh beforehand uh sir Kira. so what what do you think you um um where would you be like is this sort of like the airport departure kind of or arrivals thing where you're sort of like watching in the tower trying to see where your brother is <laughs> no i think it's uh more of a, I don't want to go up into that shaky wooden structure that could fall over at any time. Mm. So I'm going to wait for him at a tavern at the base of the tower. Kind of probably some like common, commonplace. Um, and uh, I don't have to worry about my horse because I know patches will bite anybody else who tries okay. to come. So are you inside or are you outside? Uh, I think she, if she can't get a window where she can get a direct view of like the exit door, then, um, then she'll probably be outside. Okay. Um, yeah, you probably could uh, get get a view uh, from uh, from inside. Uh, and I think what you see is um, that there's a a man who you think you recognize from before uh, as as the captain who took Halen away before. Okay. So that's if I know they're disembarking or whatever, that yep. people are starting to come down, then she'll. She'll come out. Sure. So you come out, and I think uh, Jawar, being the one who's uh, sort of mindful of your situational awareness, uh, you can first see this young armored woman kind of making her way towards, and Zartordak uh, easily as well, too. I think Sir Kira, you can see the tall, dark-haired elf standing next to his, or half-elf standing next to his brother. And um, J what's your perception bonus? Uh, actually, I got it right in front of me. Hold on. Jeez. Uh, 47. 47, and then uh, for Zartor Dak? 32. 32? Okay, so then for sure, yeah. Jawar, you're the first one who spots um, uh, Sir Kira making her way towards you. And uh, she's, not overly, she's not overly large. No. As a fighter. She's just like strong and yeah. Mm -hmm. so it's not just, like... Uh, it's not like uh, Sir Brienne of Tarth in Game of Thrones, where she like stands above most men. Yeah, yeah. No, she's a, and again, she's also like at eighteen. She's she may have so growing to do too, right? Mm -hmm. So, Jawar, you see this, and she's coming towards, and uh, I can't remember. Do you have um, heraldry as a lore? Uh, I don't think I have any lore. Oh, yeah, you got Changramai philosophy. Yeah, that's just what happens one. when you spend your uh, childhood in. Uh, uh, monastery. Uh, so oh, yeah, I just totally follow the captain's lead, especially for anything yeah. like this that is like <laughs> diplomacy or negotiation. So then, um, Zartor Dak, you can see Kara or a, a, a woman, and, you, and you're looking, and you know the tomboy uh, that you left behind, you know, eight years ago. You have to do sort of a double take to realize that this um, armored woman making her way towards you is Sir Kiera. What do you yeah. guys... Go ahead. Yeah, the Zara just uh, looks her up and down and just like, she's got maybe five inches, ten, ten inches more grown and, but I think he sees the same thing it just after a few moments of recognizing her, he's just the same person he left behind. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Sir Kiera, um, 
I guess, uh, uh, Jawar, do you, do you sort of point her out to um, the captain? Because he seems to be sort of looking around, trying to see. Yeah, I think that... Um... I don't know if he would point her out. Maybe he would just sort of, um, you know, clear his throat or something to so that the captain would turn back and then he would just sort of nod his head towards where she, like, okay. he would want it to be subtle, right? He wouldn't want to be, like, um, showing any weakness in the captain or that he didn't perceive um, sure. her. So he would sort of do it subtly. Yep, so you kind of, uh, you know, make a little sound... Uh, and then you see the captain uh, turns and make locks eyes with you, Kira, and he gives you a, like there's a huge beaming smile that crosses his face, that is wider and more welcoming and warmer than you would have expected from this person. And he walks up towards you and says, "This cannot be Lady uh, <laughs> Lady Ventier before me, is it?" Uh, she smiles and nods and it's like, and sir, now. And sir, forgive me, uh, my, and he corrects himself, forgive no me, sir. No needed, Captain. I was on, it, it's been on, nigh on a decade. Uh, Just... it has, and how you have grown into a, an impressive young knight. Welcome, you, Captain. How you, was your journey? Our journey was uh, was long, but uh, free of incident. Uh, thank you, uh, sir. I have friends here who I think that you know. And he turns and, and sort of gestures at uh, Zartor Dak. Do you recognize think, this one from before? I think there's kind of an awkward moment for a second there but i think kira's like kind of like um suddenly like flashback to like her being a young younger girl and she just basically runs up and hugs both the half elves okay and um and then she like kind of corrects herself and like <clears throat> you know like that didn't happen kind of thing and then um good to see you all and then she starts like looking like kind of between them and over their shoulders and um and uh, you can see that uh, Jawar. Uh, well, first off, Zartordak, how do you respond to that? Well, he uh, he was uh, just about to arch an eyebrow and greet her when suddenly he's got his hands up like this, like she's she's <laughs> hugging me. She's, she's <laughs> hugging me. <laughs> and he, he lets her do it. Um, and then he says, uh, Sarah? <laughs> it's like, you're a knight? Oh, yes, yeah, I, yes. <laughs> And that's that's when she straightens, you know, straightens the color on her cloak and and uh, you know, mm -hmm. kind of recollects herself. Nice. And then uh, turns and uh, Captain uh, uh, Zedek then turns says, and uh, uh, Sir Kiera, uh, I have someone to introduce to you as well too. This is Jawar of the Changramai Order. Oh, uh, well met, Jawar. I, I don't know. Is there a Honorific that I should use when greeting you? Jawar is great. It's an honor to meet you. Honor is all mine. Is what uh, what brings you here? Are you flying with the captain? Uh, it's uh, it's funny. Uh, you mentioned, uh, lady, uh, Jawar uh, is uh, has been my. Uh, he's kept me safe and lo the many years that he has uh, traveled with me but he is seeking a change uh, something that I wish to discuss with uh, with your father we will be riding with you to Myrna Dune um, uh, yes riding to study but... to study at Myrna Dune the fountain of knowledge in my father's keep my work is more physical. Hmm. And he uh, had many, there may be many tasks. The Changramai often uh, take pilgrimages and seek of uh, enlightenment. And uh, he um, may have reached, he may seem young, uh, but uh, trust me, there are many 
uh, many, many years uh, behind uh, that uh, soul of his. Yeah, I, I heard uh, Ordak say something about riding. Yeah. So, <laughs> you still not like to ride, Ordak? I've got thrown from too many horses as a child. What is your them. riding? Your riding skill is quite garbage, too, isn't it? I don't even know if I have a riding skill. Oh, yeah, I do. 27. Yeah. <laughs> I use that to ride people in cat form. <laughs> <laughs> so riding uh, with 27 tells you that you can, like you're capable of moving it around. And then the way that um, uh, riding works in combat is that you take... So to control a horse in combat takes 100% of your action. And then you subtract your riding skill from that. So... For you, if you're going to fight from horseback, uh, it would take seventy-three percent of your action to control the horse. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, Sir Kira, you're much more, and then depending on the quality of the horse as well, too. That's why Sir Kira's uh, bonus uh, having a quality horse, a plus twenty, uh, makes it a little easier for her to fight from horseback. They're also substantially faster than you guys on foot. So, um, but Captain Zedek says then. I do have, um, uh, Sir Kira, I take it your father has not joined you down here. You have been sent to... No, father is working on on something right now, and he sent me down to collect my brother. I mean, to greet my brother and and bring him home. It's been a long time. Then Is he still, is he shuffling his own bags or something? Is he talking with some young maid up in the ship? Uh, no maids on the ship, ma'am. And he's sort of, uh, he's not, he's avoiding your eyes uh, right now, Kira, and, uh, or Sir Kira, and he says, uh, Kira, Halen did not come. What do you mean did not come? He's coming home. Did something happen to him? When we last saw him, he was healthy. But it seems Halen is interested in pursuing his fortune and future uh, in Eidolon. Yeah. Ordok will uh, look at Kira and just lock eyes with her for a second as he chose to stay and leave us behind. His future, he's the heir. <laughs> what? What a fool. Uh, you can see uh, Zedek kind of, you know, he would like to agree with you, but does not feel that appropriate. He says, Kara, this is, I know, difficult and troubling news. Um, I would ask that you let me deliver the news to your father uh, such that I can. By all means. <laughs> I don't want to tell my father this. <laughs> Good. Uh, then... Um, but wait a second. No, wait. No. Um, th this can't happen. Because then that makes me the heir. And I don't want to do what they've been grooming Halen to do. I think that... <sighs> Ordak looks incredibly interested in what they may have been grooming him to do, but he doesn't say anything. I think perhaps we should... This news, though bad, will have to wait until tomorrow when we can depart for Myrna Doom. I'm sorry. Truly sorry, uh, Kiara, for bringing this news. And he, he has his, his one hand on, on your shoulder. And um, the... She, she looks at his hand and looks at him. <laughs> and then he says, forgive me, I... The news uh, is troubling. Upsetting. What I see? The gods are laughing. Uh, 
Ordak, do you know the river, uh, the small bridge just over halfway? We used to... Yes, I do remember that. I fell off a horse a couple times trying to you race were... you over it. You didn't fall at... You were. It was close to the bridge when you fell, but there was mud there. You were... I remember things very differently. Okay, well... Strange... I had a strange day today, and there were three... Maybe we shouldn't be discussing this in the open. Captain, where are you staying tonight? Uh, are we not all staying at the obelisk? The obelisk. Okay, good. Just making sure. Um, Varthalon is still there, is he not? Yes. I I told somebody I would meet. Can she figure out how long it's been until she's supposed to meet... um, Garash? Uh, it's probably in uh, maybe an hour or so. And from what Garash or uh, Pixink said, uh, he seems to know Ordak as well. Yeah, he would, He would, because we would have come together as a group at some point. Um, also, Zordak have... seems to have always been inclined towards the seedier side, too. Yeah. The Dark hides many secrets. So, um, I will meet you at... The obelisk. I have some things to do. I think. Um, and uh, uh, Captain Zedek kind of steps forward and says, "And Lady, uh, Sir, Kira, I know this news is is troubling, but your father and you and the Ventiers will persevere." Oh, I have no doubt of that. Just in what fashion? Indeed. Uh, then, if if you don't mind, uh, and if he, uh, he is a very amiable companion, this is Jawar's first time here, and he has certainly spent more than enough time listening to me tell the same stories at the tavern. It's been a long time since I've seen Vartalon. Uh, I'll be making my way to the obelisk, but... Would you mind if Jawar accompanied you? I would not mind. Um, Not in the least. And he kind of looks back at you. Jawar gives you a bit of a knowing look. Yeah, I think that... um, Maybe we have some sort of a a bow or something that I taught him that was something from the monastery that we sort of do. And... uh, then I, I go and stand behind Sir Kira in the same fashion that I've been standing behind um, the captain this whole time. Uh, Ordak like leans forward and kind of like loudly whispers to Kira, he's very good at watching people's backs. <laughs> yeah, I'm like over your shoulder now. <laughs> okay. Um, well, I'm gonna just gonna look at my character's picture again. I'm pretty sure she's right-handed. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Um, she's like, I don't need protection on my shield side, if that makes sense. <laughs> okay, you'll stand. So you'll like, switch sides. Yeah, you'll switch sides. Yeah, you can be, you can be on his right. She's totally cool with that because she'll have the shield on the left. She's yeah. Like, <laughs> okay. And then she's like, um, she'll 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 let the captain head off. And she'll like quickly turn and go, Bordak, we need to go see Garash. He's got something that he's meant for Kaya and she hasn't seen her in a while. Do you think uh, uh, Beggar's still alive? Bordak, yeah. So, the, do you, uh, so one of the things with that um, the Lagroki have is with the um, uh, if the legends are true uh, and they have elven heritage, they are <laughs> extremely long lived. Yeah, I do wish to see him. I have questions. Okay. So let me do this. I'll make this a little bit. (laughs) I've learned a lot in my time away, Ser Kira. Okay. And I've learned to love secrets. Jawar, we're going to meet somebody whose appearance is... uh... is quite ugly. Thank you, Ordak. Looks do not affect my judgment. That's good. Smell might. Smell does not affect my judgment. (laughs) Because the... 
the individual within is as trustworthy as one might find to an extent all you need to say sir Kara is that you trust him your word is a bond for me fair enough let's be off to the wharf okay well probably not very far but no, it's not. I mean, it, it's uh, to get to here, sort of one of the warehouses is near where um, people would drop off, but it's one of the ones that has sort of fallen into d- disrepair. So uh, as you guys get to uh, this area, it's, it, it does require you to sort of take a, a step off uh, from where you were uh, or from sort of one of the main streets and you make your way back and you can hear from the... Uh... Oh, here, let's do this. Let's do this. Um... Why don't you guys each give us a perception check? Oh, Could be a roll for pig stinks. Hide. Let's see if anyone spots this hiding place. Or Dak, you see him. So does uh, Kira. Yeah, you guys can all see. So he's <sighs> he's fine. quite well. I mean, like for the average person, he's quite well hidden. Right. Uh, it, it would be difficult to spot, but he's sort of. Uh, for a, a big and kind of smelly, you know, Legroki, uh, it would be, it's surprising that yeah, how well he can kind of hide himself. It's, but each of you sort of spots him before, and then he steps out. Uh, who's, who's your friends? So can is that, oh, Doc, is that you? It's the night wolf himself, pig stink. <laughs> you were as ripe as I remember. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and you were but... tall, taller than you were. There's something strange about your eyes, though. Uh, yeah, he kind of like looks left and right and then looks at pig stink and he shrugs. Mm. I, I have... I've learned many things while I'm away. <laughs> oh, it's a secret. Oh, who's your friend? Is he... Wait, you one of them Chengramai? Jawar. Jawar. Oh. He's with us. You hired a, a bodyguard. He's a friend. Call him a friend. Friend, eh? All right. Well, you say he's a friend. To, you wanted to meet. You said there was something important. Oh, I did. You needed to tell to tell Kaya, and she hasn't been around. So where to go to small. Kaya, and where to go back to wherever Kaya is speaking to? I did. I hear that your your brother not come home. No. No. Oh. I'm... I'm sorry. Uh, but... Uh, maybe this will be more important than that you get this word back. I've been keeping my eyes out, watching what comes through the obelisk, what comes in from the sea. Mm-hmm. What I saw. What's come through the obelisk. There's some mucky mucks coming from Lethis. Now, Jawar, that makes your ears perk up. Lethis is the largest merchant city in all of the empire of Rakan. You may remember Rakan is... I've got the... Was uh, the the south one, one, Yes, the Phoenix Empire. Lethis is... Uh, it, you can kind of picture like a supercharged Venice at its height mm-hmm. is what Lethis is like. Phenomenal wealth, um, you know, uh, the uh, backing of the Phoenix Empire. This is, it's a decent port here, but he says, I think there's something going on. The Lethis have been meeting with the Duke. I think they've got something planned. I don't know what so. And two nights ago, we had some of them priests from Elisa come in. The ones what worship the sea drake. 
And what you would know is that the church, the C Drake, I, I mentioned this in the handout, but like religion is not necessarily tied up with divine magic or channeling magic in this setting. They could be completely, you know, non-magical organizations. They could be things back with uh, different kinds of magic, like mentalism or whatnot, or they could genuinely be actual, you know, wielders of divine power, of, of uh, channeling uh, power. What the um, Sea Drake the, uh, have been doing, they've effectively been the rulers of Helisa for the last 50 years or a little more. Mm. They are not present here. The Church of, of uh, the Sea Drake or Cult of the Sea Drake kind of goes hand in hand along the coast, at least the southern coast of the Bay of Ulor with the rulership of Elisa. If you open your doors to the church, sort of what follows next is them coming in to try and take over the region and fold it in with Elisa. Troubling. I will definitely pass this on. Hey. You see a lot of strange things, my friend. That's what, that's what I get paid for, no? Has Kaya paid you recently? Kaya's paid me relatively recently. <laughs> Five tin? Five tins. That's all that's worth. No, uh, we'll call it ten. Ten tin. Ten tin is much appreciated. We're, and we're I've got kind of scoffs. And, and I've got something else, though, that I want you to look at to include within that 10 tin. Oh, what's that? She waves him closer. She reaches into her pouch and she pulls out that fragment of the shuriken. And, and oh. she's like, this weapon lodged in someone's throat recently. I can't place it. Oh, I've heard of, I don't know. Jawar, would you, but, yeah, do I would you give us a um, uh, lore Changramai philosophy, please? That's really good. So you see this thing for a second, and for one, you recognize this as, as, as Sir Kira is describing it as a weapon. You recognize it as a shuriken. But it is not a shuriken that your order would use. Mm -hmm. The manufacturer, you, you uh, like, you see this? Do you do anything right now, Sir? Yeah, I was going to say, like, as soon as she pulls it out, I think like his reaction is he his hand quickly comes out to almost grab it, and then instead, as it as it gets close, he turns it down and opens his palm out up to her, and he says, "Sir Kira, may I see that?" Uh, Pig stink uh, kind of looks. Oh, the monk speaks. She looks. At, she looks the pig stink first to to see if he's got any. Has he got a glint in his eye, or he have any clue? Uh, he, he seems to not even recognize it necessarily as a weapon. Okay, then I'll just kind of like thank you and let her let him go, and she'll turn and box him out and okay. um, pass this to Jawar. So Jawar, you take a look at this. Big thing can go in his own way. Yeah. <laughs> well, he's got his money. <laughs> Nothing more for me. And Zardak is going to give him a 10 tens and say, I'll, I'll see you later. I will see you later. <laughs> we got to get caught up, old Doc. Got to hear about them eyes. And, oh. Oh. Lady Kira. I. <clears throat> yes? I don't want to be rude, but. Okay. Um, I've heard rumors about your nuptials. I don't know whether there's any truth to that, but what I hear, you know that the Duke's son, he's been squire to someone down in Elisa. Strange. Wait, nuptials? <laughs> What I've heard is... She gives Ordak a, a look like, don't ask. <laughs> <laughs> what I've heard is that 
he might be returning soon, but that he's gone native and taken up that faith of theirs. So as they say, at least. I'm, uh... I'm and sorry. Seen, and you've seen priests of Elisa? Priests of a sea drake, I... Mm. Oh. Uh, so, one of the things that... I think those who are... Who, those who fancy themselves... Um you know, uh, heirs to sort of the the different states and whatnot that are here. Uh, there, among many of the nations here, there still is that sort of golden age believed of when the different, you know, rulers who had the crowns, the, the various rulers of the realms had them. So, you know, even though thousands of years have passed since that time, even in these wildlands of warlords and you know, uh, you know, uh, petty kingdoms and things like that, here they still may fancy yourselves. You guys would still use the coinage of Ulishak, uh, albeit ancient coinage, and you may justify your titles based on those ancient lineages as well, too, whether deserved or not. Mm. Uh, so, the reason I mention that is because with these, you know come up and ones to say that they are the rulers of Elisa or that they're, you know, the ones of Elisa or whatnot would be for true patriots or true um, supporters of the crown, they may still recognize them as regents. You are placeholders. You are not the rulers. If that makes sense. Like Denethor. Very much so. Yeah, yeah. Like where it's just the... Superseding his his uh, authority yeah and it's it's like not for nothing the the priests have and the the cult of uh, the sea drake have not taken control of uh, elisa they've not assumed the the kingship they still hold it out yeah, yeah. Like, you know so anyway he um he turns and uh kind of uh you know uh, makes his way around the corner and he very quickly disappears in in the uh, crowd now jawar what you know is for one you guys don't use this stuff but in the same way that they're I mean the Chagramai are the most um, legendary kind of order uh, in, uh, in, in not only in Emer but even in uh, Jamin and, and the surrounding regions uh, and the other continents kind of right around there all across Shadow World but the they're, they certainly are not the only order of monks and assassins who make use of uh, such weapons. Right. This has a specific kind of... One second here. Uh, there are specific markings on here that... They're almost like faint scales... Now, that's not uncommon for anyone living on the coast here. But it makes you think of a, a cult that you've never encountered but probably have heard of. They're mm -hmm. called the Monks of Yarth. And where the Changramai walk in the open, the monks of Yarth are said to be a secretive order and that their devotion is to the iron wind, the nihilistic force allied to the unlife. And this, if this for one for it to have broken this is a poor imitator this is not something forged from some of the deadliest uh, objects that, that would be um, you know that would date back to the wars of the dominion but clearly if this was if it's as Sir Kira told you and this was drawn from the body of someone and with the precision that she described 
you know, um, it certainly did its job. Right. You know something, Jawar? He uh, he reaches out to hand the the fragment back to Sir Kira, and he says, "This is a weapon of those who have ways similar to mine, but this is not of my order." And sort of as it's in her hand, he would point he would point at the sort of the scaly symbols on there, like as if she's supposed to know, like. You know, this means it's not <laughs> what it's supposed to mean, and he just points at them. And this is not of our my order. It's and then, it, it could be, if I may speak from estimation, from the monks of Yarth. Monks of Yarth. Uh, Either just sorry, Zart or Dak uh, and uh, uh, Sir Kira, do you guys have uh, lore history? Trying to think, Monks of Yarth. What do I recall? That's streetwise. You know, my father does have this extensive library, and I spent some time amongst the so, tomes. Of interest, your father, one of your father's um, particular areas of interest is uh, the history of Uli Shock. Ooh, good roll. Uh, and one, what you remember is that this would have dated back to probably like the second millennia of the third age of Ire. There was a uh, king, uh, a king of... Uh, one of the successor kingdoms uh, of, I think, uh, it is Lia Liasa. Hold on. Well, it's in any event the it's the uh, same kingdom that, that the region that would be covered by you uh, by where you uh, live now, the northern uh, successor kingdom. It's said that he was struck down by an assassin uh, of the Iron Wind, and it spoke of the Knives of Yarth. She re relay this to the group. But I don't understand. I found these on bodies between here and home. Why would assassins murder three people? And what would they be doing in my country? Perhaps it is fortunate Halen did not return. That misfortune you speak, friend, passes to Ser Kira. He kind of reaches out and taps her armor with his staff. I think she's better prepared than he was. She and has us as well. Better protected. But the story that I just explained was a king that was killed. I'm not king. I'm or queen. My father is. Father is a lord in oh, service lord. to the duke. Yeah, the he's duke. A, yeah, a lord in service to the duke. But where she's going with this is that if someone's going to be, it would possibly be her father is what she's worried about. Yeah. Well, and this also, this assassination would have taken place about 4,000 years ago. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but the most recent ones were four days ago. And only a half day's ride from my house. And, you know, Jawar standing next to you, that's 10, 10 millennia of, tr of history and tradition embodying in his training, so... Yeah, we're Jawar, good. Good. Jawar would um, take the, the shard out of her hand again, and he said, um, he would say, this weapon may have been effective enough, and he sort of squeezes it in his hand and a drop of blood comes out but then he opens his hand and he says but it is of poor quality I shall be able to protect you from those who would wield these thank you thank you uh, so much today I, I 
we should get back to the obelisk. Um, maybe the captain's not going to want to leave at night. I don't. I don't imagine. But we'll have to leave as early as possible, even before before first light. How about we let the captain play catch up? Night holds no terror to me. It is the the horses cannot see at night, uh, so it would be dangerous to. to make your way through a uh, mountain uh, we saw the uh, mountain path uh, in the evening yes but we could leave even prior to first light and by the time certainly by the time you, you start making your way through uh, difficult terrain I guess the other thing to remember is that those bodies are four days old right so if somebody was going somewhere they are already well beyond the only destination uh, that you have along that route, unless you are a member of the Sisters of Aisa and you're a servant of the Keeper, and you would want to go deeper in and find uh, the uh, find Winter Watch, um, the only destination along that route is Myrna Doom. So if there was someone who made their way up there and wanted to hide themselves among strangers, the visiting scholars at Myrna Doom is absolutely a place they could do that. I need to return home. I need to return home fast. Okay. First, to the obelisk. I think as we make our way back to the obelisk, um, Jawara is now walking even closer to Sir Kira, probably so close over her, sh her shoulder that it's awkwardly close, but at the same time he never disrupts your movements or bumps into you or it's always sort of like right there but not if you turn quickly he turns quickly and you never bump into him kind mm -hmm. of thing yeah yeah awesome so as what we'll end with guys is you guys make your way into the obelisk and the obelisk is very busy uh, as it usually is you guys make your way in. There's loud, uh, you know, uh, people drinking from all over. Um, a wide variety of um, unusual looking uh, customers. The thing that catches your eye, uh, I suppose, Jawar, one thing that catches your eye is sitting at one table it is something you don't see often. You see them sometimes out and about, but not terribly often. And that is a navigator. Ooh. And you can tell it's a navigator because what not depicted on the illustration uh, is hanging around his neck, there is a large brass or gold like sextant. And that is a, regardless of what guild they come from, navigators often wear those. But apart from just the um, the strange or the, uh, I guess, unusual presence of a navigator, what's even more unusual is who is sharing the table and drinks with him. And that is this. And you have no earthly idea what or who that is. But this fur being is drinking from a mug uh, and is eating from a plate of food that is set between the navigator and this creature or being. You've never seen anything like this before. In any of your many travels, in any of the more exotic ports, uh, this is either, it's dressed in clothing, as you can see in the uh, illustration as well. But that is quickly the novelty of this uh, is disrupted. And you can see also in here, in addition to sort of the locals and uh, some of the, the pe people from Elisa and, and uh, elsewhere, uh, there are a couple of uh, Sirkakar uh, in here as well too. Uh, two women. Sirkakar warriors. Kind of look like this, guys. They're a lower tech level uh, than what uh, anyone in the Duchy of, uh, of um, Cloven Bay have or the North and the women kind of look like that. 
there are mercenaries or some kind of barbarians from Saral. Uh, that's the uh, the former land of Saralus, the land of the uh, Wyvern. They are also likewise quite uh, primitive, but very effective mercenaries. But some of them are also uh, merchants. The thing that is the most boisterous and that draws the most attention is, of course, the shout that comes from across the obelisk that causes almost everyone to drop silent. And that's the big, loud, welcoming... Brother! <laughs> and... Or Dak, you see clomping towards you on his peg leg and his cane. Is that my brother? Have you come home? Come here, you! He comes in and picks you up. My little brother's come home! Nearly as tall as you are. Release me. Oh, <laughs> all still the same. So soft, but so prickly inside. Where, where's your brother? Where's your twin? Thank you. Arlen, you. Ordak was saying how much he loved your hugs. <laughs> Don't think you're going to get away without one, Lady Kira. He comes in and gives you a big hug as well. Sure. Or, or, now, where's that brother of yours? He's here too, isn't he? He heard you and ran. I don't blame him. <laughs> Not you. I'll find my brother in no time. Where's your brother, Lady Kira? Isn't he supposed to be back too? He's not here. He's not. We'll, we'll discuss that another time. Uh, he kind of meets eyes with you, uh, Ordak. Like, what the fuck's going on? Yeah. Well, well, well. Um. More for you to drink, then. Come in, come in. Drinks will be on me. My brother's home! Er early departure tomorrow. I will not have anything tonight. But, oh, come um, on. Live a little. This is the first time I could legally drink here. <laughs> come on in. Then, as you guys are making your way in... I'm sure um, that will make the horseback riding much easier for you tomorrow. <laughs> uh, it's it's going to be a blur anyway. Uh, what... You can see um, in a corner of your war, because you sort of, you know, make your uh, looking, you, you sort of study the surroundings. In uh, one corner, um, there are eight men all dressed identically who look like this. Uh oh. And they surround a man who looks like this. He has the look of a uh, an elf, uh, but not a uh, Diari, like uh, a dark elf, like uh, Ordak's father. He is probably a Loari, uh, or perhaps um, uh, the other, who I can't remember <laughs> offhand. But he has around his neck a mark of, has a, sty uh, sorry, a stylized sea drake in it, with a dark, almost like charcoal colored background. And you can see that his eyes are on your charge. My hand is on my side. <laughs> nice. And that is where we will bring our first session to a close, guys. Nice. So. Put your thing down there now. Uh, we're not granting any XP uh, for this time, uh, so we don't need to go through that. But uh, yeah, could, could I uh, like that that Udu thing was really interesting to, to Dordak. Could he have spent a point to to study him with his mystical change ability? Uh, oh yeah, mystic change is a uh, a spell, isn't it? Yeah, it's a if I study him, I can change into a kind, make myself look similar to him, not exactly like him. Yeah, yeah, uh, go ahead. It's, uh, so it just, give it just us, looks us here. really interesting. Yeah, yeah, I know he's a, an unusual. It's uh, you've never seen anything like that, even yeah. in uh, the like um, Eidolon, like the you know the priest, the uh, merchant barons of Eidolon travel all over the world and and bring all sorts of strange things back. You've never seen anything like that, at least not ascension like that. Okay, so let's see here. Your, which, I'm sorry, which uh, spell? Let's do uh, you want to study uh, mystical char change. Okay, yeah, yeah, study. study. Okay. 
Yeah, there's this no is... uh, resistance. So yeah, you just uh, we, a couple of gestures yeah, because that is a man. Oh, it's an essence and mentalism. So you have to say something out okay. loud as well. But what the hell is that? <laughs> <laughs> and that is committed to memory. Um, then, guys, Sweet. with that, we'll bring our first session to a close. So for those listening at home, thank you so much. And the um, I, I'm not sure if you guys either saw in uh, Discord or you saw on the description, but we are calling this mini campaign Heirs of Sea and Sorrow. Thank you so much for joining us for those listening at home for our first uh, session of uh, Rollmaster 2nd Edition. We didn't do any combat today. We did spend our first uh, bit of the session playing through the some um, the particulars of combat so we'd be ready to jump in uh, when we go. So if you are looking to see some of those critical hits show up, yeah, I wouldn't worry that's going to be that long. Um, as is always the case, if you have any comments, questions, or concerns regarding the session, the campaign, or the game we're playing, please do not hesitate. Leave a comment in the comment section below, and I'll endeavor to reply in a timely fashion. In addition, you can find a link down below to the Dungeon Musings Discord server, where all of us are active, and we have game, uh, channels dedicated to Every campaign we run on the channel, every game we run on the channel, for the most part, I don't have a Rollmaster channel set up yet, but I will probably do that uh, after the session. Um, so if you do have any questions about Rollmaster uh, or the version of Rollmaster we're playing or the house rules we're playing with for Rollmaster, please don't hesitate to uh, join us on over there. You can also find me on Twitter at Dungeon Musings, and you can find me by email. My email address is dungeonmusings at gmail.com. Um, in addition, uh, there is a link down below to something called Heroes Save Villages. That is the charity fundraising campaign that we run on the channel. It benefits the SOS Children's Villages International Charity, a really terrific organization active in over 130 countries that benefits over 80,000 orphan and abandoned children. From uh, now until December 1st, 2021, for every $25 that you donate through that link, and all donations go directly to SOS Children's Villages International. None of it goes to the channel or any other middleman. It just goes directly to help the kids who benefit from their services. For every $25 Canadian you, you donate, you get a chance to win the grand prize or one of the other great prizes we will have for our next charity raffle. The final one of the year. And uh, that draw will be live on uh, December 1st. Um, in addition to the donations, uh, if you have donated, or the uh, raffle, if you have donated since Oct uh, August 1st, be sure to check in on our Charity Initiatives channel on the Dungeon Musings Discord server, because uh, in a couple of weeks' time, you'll have a chance to spend some of the money you donated to help outfit our heroes for some up uh, the upcoming Werewolf the Apocalypse game that we'll be playing on October 30th. Uh, the voters have spoken, and uh, we will be playing a um, 80s style like kids at summer camp adventure played with Werewolf the Apocalypse uh, to celebrate our uh, horror month uh, for um, uh, October. Uh, so uh, you get a chance to have it, and then there will be again if you have donated since October, August first, or you will afterwards. You will also have a chance to vote on our final game, which I believe is Tournament of Champions. It will be all the games we have run for our charity sessions to date, and we'll have see which one of them we'll be returning to for our final charity session of 2021. Last thing I will say is an enormous thank you to our players. Uh, Dave and uh, I think Jeff might have as well mentioned in uh, in chat, there was an enormous amount of homework, as it were, that I offered the characters <laughs> for this stuff. And the guys gave me some terrific uh, material to work with too for, uh, for how to role play. So uh, guys, uh, thank you so much for uh, role playing, bringing these, these amazing, uh, these characters to life in such an amazing way. I had so much fun tonight and I cannot wait for Wednesday. Yeah, it was a lot of fun, Cap. Thanks. Awesome. I can't wait to uh, make use of a particular skill you gave my character. <laughs> that one. You know, nice. <laughs> Hello, I'm monkey man. <laughs> not, in monkey. not in the monkey. <laughs> I'm not trying to hit the monk, because that'll, you know. <laughs> yeah. <the> monk. <laughs> in the free game, I couldn't hit the monk for beans, so I need to try and hit something that I actually I can actually smoke. So. Well, uh, wait, wait till I like distract them and make, you know bring down the defenses, and then beat the crap out of them. Yeah, yeah it's going to be interesting to uh, yeah, they, they, it'll be interesting um, seeing you trying to get your spells off while the others try and keep you. You get from a minus getting... thirty to everything. Minus thirty to everything. 
awesome. <laughs> then, uh, for those listening at home, we'll be back with our next session of this on uh, Wednesday and then uh, Friday. And then, as a reminder, I am going to be on vacation from October 14th until October 24th. Uh, so we will have no sessions during that time. But um, all of the sessions on Wednesdays and Fridays when we do have games uh, this month, we will be playing this campaign. So um, we'll see you again. Uh, until next time, uh, we hope that we gave you a few hours. Take your mind off the troubles of our world and think about the troubles that our heroes are div uh, are learning about in the uh, Duchy of Cloven Bay. And until we see you again, stay safe, stay healthy, and happy gaming. <laughs>